to imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total protonic reversal. Protonic reversal. Protonic reversal with your host, Kevin Neutron. Broadcasting from a secret underground lair in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A gigantic middle finger to everything that we've brought about music, rock and roll, and corporate power. The thing is, though, if you don't laugh, you're going to go on a killing spree with sharp and nails. Confidence of a hero or a fool, I wasn't exactly certain which. Could not be more professional. It's all It means something. It means something. And they got away. You know, that's my take. Like, what's yours? Protonic reversal. That's like a science thing, right? Indeed, indeed, indeed it is. This is a science thing. This is a science place. It's a scientific fact. They were all up in your face. It's time once again for the one, the only... Protonic Reversal. Welcome to it, welcome to it, welcome to it. Special edition, special edition. Uh, I'm doing this to uh, accommodate someone I've, I've actually been wanting to have on the show for a long time. And an uh, incredible artist with a, with a great body of work. We'll get into that, because of course we're going to be talking to Jamie Stewart. But before we do that, welcome to Conan Neutron's Protonic Reversal. I'm your host, Conan Neutron. I am a rock and roll lifer who has been touring and recording for 23 plus Years. I need to amend that. Most known for the band Kona Neutra and the Secret Friends. Music is a huge part of my life, and I use the format of this very long running podcast to talk about music with musicians whose work I enjoy and respect, but who may not be household names. This is episode 365. Now, if this is your first time listening to the show, archives that are available for free, no ads, no sponsors, no kidding, at protonicriversal.com. However, if you want to support the show and get episodes sooner, $1 a month at patreon.com slash Reversal will achieve that goal. And if you like the show or even just a single episode, please feel free to like, subscribe on your platform of choice, share it around the internet, and even leave a review. All that helps people discover the show, beats back the almighty algorithmic overlords. And it's just a darn nice thing to do. So there we go. Zushu, man, I, I'm I'm super excited to uh, to talk to Jamie. I've been been a Zushu fan since pretty much the inception of uh, being uh, from the Bay Area and all. And it's been a long time since I've talked to this person, so I'm very excited to bring on the air right now uh, the Zushu Impresario, uh, incredible artist and uh, someone very very intelligent, very creative. Uh, Jamie Stewart, welcome to the show. Ah, you're very nice. Thank you. I was trying to think, I think the first time I saw you, I think was with Yvonne. So this is like... Whoa, yeah, that's the very beginning. Really you know early Yvonne? on. Yeah, yeah well, uh, uh, through George. Oh, uh, cool. Yvonne actually got me a NASA hoodie when she, <laughs> she worked there. <laughs> that was stolen from me along with... Gosh, a... I forgot she worked at NASA. That's right. Wow. Yeah, crazy, right? And I was like, yeah. I was, it was like my favorite hoodie I wore it every day. And, I, and that and a first edition copy of The Gunslinger by Stephen King uh, and something else were stolen out of my bag coming back from the airport for something. And I was so devastated and all those Not things. Good. Not good. Uh, but yeah, I saw a lot of those pretty early on uh, Zushu shows, uh, which is which is crazy to think about because that was a very long time ago. That was an extraordinarily <laughs> long time ago. Yeah. Those early shows were all really bad. We were not good when we first started. <laughs> I, I think you definitely found your thing, and you definitely locked into it and moved at it with propulsive force. But it was definitely there was a feeling out process for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were we were we were figuring it out. But that, I I I have very fond memories of that of that super early lineup just because of there was there was so much feeling out. Um, yeah, and you know everybody seemed open to potentially sucking <laughs> in order to try something different <laughs> well because i even remember you from 10 in the swear jar uh oh wow when which which is back. yeah way back when right and and i just remember because it was like um you and Corey and yvonne and 
Lauren Andrews. Uh, Lauren, Lauren, right? Yeah, yeah. And it was sort of the first thing I noticed. I was like, I was like, oh, there's all these like baroque instruments and stuff. Like, what what's happening? This is this is like interesting. I don't think I've ever seen this before in this context. Like, just from an instrumentation standpoint, and it seemed at one time both like bold and delicate at the same time. That's very sweet. And I just didn't didn't remember seeing hearing a lot of those things like that at that time. And then you would hit onto something and it'd be like, wow, this is really cool. And you hit other things, I'm like, I'm not sure what they're going for here, but I'm like along for the ride. We probably have just <laughs> fucked it up. Yeah. So okay. that's that's that if it if it suddenly <laughs> did not make any sense, that probably meant that we fucked it up. That's uh that's very generous of you. I appreciate that. Well, because it it's to me it seemed like there was like a nod to certain elements of those early days especially like philip glass and penderecki and stuff like that along with just sort of uh like like nina simone and um uh the freaking I, I i'm trying to um little jimmy uh little jimmy scott little jimmy scott thank you yes yes yeah. where this is like incredible like and, and I'm, I'm trying not to invoke David Lynch too much. I want to talk about the David Lynch records, but like the kind of singer where he's you a, have he's a he's a massive, massive, massive influence on us. Yes. From, from the beginning, yeah, and re, and remains so. So I, I, I I don't take it badly at all. I yeah, think no, we talked huge, huge guiding light for us. I think first time you and I had a conversation, we talked about him at the Metro for some reason. It was a very random thing to talk about, but like I was like, oh my, oh my god, that's awesome! I love, love that guy. That's great. But because there's this real like single spotlight in a room suddenly appears. Uh, in your mind, if not uh, realistically, level of just pained, in some cases, earnestness that, you know, like the clock stops, like everything in the room stops, like e even early on, like early on, like, and which is weird when you're playing like punk rock bills almost, right? <laughs> I mean, experimental bills, but like bills where like there's bands that have a more aggressive energy and are more, um, that's that's not an unfair assessment. Performance though. oriented. That's a nice took, way to put it. It took a right? long time for us to sort of end up in venues where that were, for the lack of a better word, appropriate for what we were doing. But you know, I mean, we would play. We would play anywhere, um, and uh, you know, so I mean, that happens to any band when they first start out. You just yeah. sort of you end up playing with whoever is also available that night, whether or not it necessarily is complimentary. And there's something to be said for just playing with bands you like too that are like oh those there's are that too I mean we we would frequently play with friends and yeah. all of our friends bands were on different trajectories and they were nice enough to you know to let us open for them if they had a little bit more going on which really helped us get rolling so let's I mean, since I'm already gone down this nostalgia train anyway why don't we why don't we start off with uh, with knife play we'll, we'll just we'll kind of go sequentially here right because because I want to talk about the new stuff but like I feel like some of that stuff. Uh, um, it easily gets forgotten about in the conversation just because it is like baby pictures, right? To a certain degree. Uh, but I feel like there's embers of almost everything that you've done there. It's just in this very kind of rock that needs to be chiseled down and do the thing, right? Uh, but that's a good record. I actually listened to it again for the first time in, in uh, like quite a while. And I was like, oh, this, this record's very good. Uh, so tell me about recording that first record. That was... Um, Absolutely kosher to the LP. Corey, uh, right? It was on, on uh, 5RC. 5RC. Which, uh, did which, these... was a, which is part of Kill Rock Stars. Which is crazy to think about because at the time CDs were the thing and LPs yeah. had not really made the comeback. And I have to say that every once in a while for the younger listeners because that is not the case now. Uh, so tell me about Knife Play. Think, tell me about that, that early lineup. Uh, so it was with uh, the aforementioned Corey McCulloch, who I played with in Ten of the Square Jar, Yvonne Chen, and uh, Lauren Andrews. We my My dad had worked at uh pro tools in it in its early days so he had essentially stolen and kind of frankenstein together a bunch of like prototypes at that time this would have been in 2002 right it's like you couldn't get i mean pro tools was you know like as much as a car cost yeah you know you know and now it's almost you know nothing um so he had gotten us this completely frankenstein together pro tool setup literally of like things that they made like two prototypes of that shouldn't have worked together and he just kind of put them under his arm left work and said okay my he, he had been in the music business for a long time and was trying to trying to help us out so we recorded it in my uh in my bedroom and a terrible completely 
a horrifying place to live called Fort Awesome, where Corey and I both lived with about 15 other ne'er-do-wells. Um, we had absolutely no regard for the comfort of our roommates and would record <laughs> ear piercing <laughs> volumes whenever yeah. we wanted. We were horrible roommates. Um, at one point, one of the guys tried to tried to kick us out. Um, and I, you know, I mean, obviously it sucked at the time, but looking back now, I probably would have murdered me. <laughs> I wouldn't even have bothered kicking me out. Uh, but yeah, we just kind of did it in the bedroom and living room. Um, and I think we would rehearse once a week you know, on Thursdays or something. And that's when we would do writing and then generally record at the same time. And um, my, afore, my aforementioned dad was a record producer for a long time. And I, we were going to have it mastered. Uh, and I asked him to come listen to the mixes just to give him a, you know, a little advice. And he was furious that the vocals were too quiet. Um, and he made me like, we had already done all the mixes and he made me, if you don't know if computer audio, I'm sure everybody knows how computer audio works at this point. So you have like the two tracks and then he made me just like line up an additional vocal track by itself. So he could, he could turn it up. So he could crank it. <laughs> so he could, he could crank it. Yeah. Um, and it probably is the only thing that made that, record even remotely listenable <laughs> so he, he saved the day but it was yeah i mean and you know we had a bunch of friends a lot of people who worked on this where dirt played on it and other other uh, other acquaintances um jason albertini who's in duster played on it yeah, we used to work at a record store together um these these horn players from this uh ska band called fear may that we used to be friends with uh they played horns on it um well, and the vocals were kind of yeah, the, the, they're sort of the entry point, right? They're they're like the the threading line for what were a lot of bold and cool ideas and uh, experimentation. But like, I, I think for for me, that was the thing that initially I was like, oh, that's interesting because I did. I feel like at the time there wasn't a lot of that going around in those circles. If that makes sense. And, yeah, yeah. Early two thousands. We were we were in a funny position because in the early 2000s in San Francisco, there was a very vibrant, like actual scene and the classic idea of what a scene is. Right. Um, and and that was, you know, kind of based around essentially like noise rock and sort of like experimental noise rock is what was going on there. Yeah. Um, and we in addition to not sounding anything like that at all, we also lived in San Jose, which now it's kind of the Bay Area is the Bay Area. But at that time. It if wasn't. you were from San Jose, <laughs> you were a loser. Like, oh, um, to the South Bay, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because what was going on in the South Bay at the time was, like, new metal, third wave ska, and, like, Psycho Billy is kind of... Right, you know, Smash like, Mouth came out of there, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Things like, like that, and, you know, that's and, what... Like Papa Roach and, and stuff like that. That was what was yeah. happening. Right. Um. So, so in in some ways, uh, so we didn't have anything to do with either of those worlds and weren't interested in them. Um, but we knew we obviously weren't going to play with bands like Papa Roach. We had more to do sort of, you know, socio-ethically with, you know, bands like, you know, Flying Ludenbachers and Deerhoof, even though we didn't sound anything like them. Yeah, but that's, yeah. what, that's what was happening. So, um, Well, it so seemed we would... like you guys slotted very well with them, even if maybe sound-wise it didn't always make sense. Uh, like, like, was the, always super, super nice to us. Yeah, the mindset, nice the mindset yeah. matched, right? Like if, the, if even if the sound didn't. Yeah, uh, some of the bands were not super nice to us because you know, well, uh, I mean, we were we didn't have anything to do with what they were doing, and like I said, we were from the the right. shitty part of the air. You know, we were dorks. <laughs> we were uncool, yeah, yeah. not rocking dorks. Yeah. Um, which applies to this day. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, Deerhoof also dorks. So I, they were nice yeah. to us. Right. I, I think they could sort of see the sort of the nerd thread. And um, and they actually got us on 5RC. And, and Greg is, to this day, the drummer from Deerhoof is one of my closest friends. I, I think I did um, a series of episodes with them where we went through every Deerhoof record. And, and, oh, nice. <laughs> and there's like, I think, five of them? Like four or five of them, but I I swear and I almost kick myself for it. But the first, I'd say the first half of the first one is mostly just reminiscing about the Bay Area back in the day. I'm like, oh. and I'm usually better uh, yeah, about that. But like, it, I it was it was a, it was a time. I mean, there was a. I mean, we it's it's funny because we were essentially kept on the outside of all of that stuff. 
for the yeah. aforementioned reasons. But it was it was a very it was a real uh, it was a super creative period. It's the last other than in I mean other than you know Brooklyn maybe like four or five years later is the last and I guess around, there was some stuff in LA around that time too but like it was sort of like the end of there being scenes essentially in the United yeah. States based you know I, you know just the internet kind of made it irrelevant um, but it was you know it was uh, as far as you know an underground art rock culture it was it was it was exciting even if we were kept at bay <laughs> right and we would you know we wouldn't have uh we wouldn't we nothing would have ever happened for us if, if we didn't live there at that time or near some some kind of scene i mean um it where you lived at that time and kind of mattered if if uh if things were going to get rolling for you you needed to have some sort of local support which yeah because i mean in la there was like the the smell world the smell yeah you know like that and all the bands around that which is which is vibrant and cool and yeah, we we would play there occasionally, and it was that was an that was exciting for us because that was er, an early, a really early place that we went. And we're like, oh, okay, you know, and the bands and the bands around the smell were a little more far out than the bands that were in the Bay Area at the time. Yeah, and we uh, always went over better there than we would at like Chemos or something like that in San Francisco, um, and certainly more than we would have in San Jose. So it it was it was it was very encouraging for us to go oh okay this potentially you know some you know we we could conceivably persist there's other other parts of the world to explore that might be a little bit more supportive with whatever bs we were trying to concoct <laughs> well no because that does matter because because sometimes finding your audience and finding your people doesn't mean just playing a million shows where you live you have to kind of get out in the world um yeah, it's especially. I mean, especially then, you know. I mean, because things were much more segmented and much more I, insular. I found that to be the same way personally. I mean, like, I yeah. think, I think if if Replicator had stuck around the Bay Area, I don't think we would ever have done anything, frankly. <laughs> but like, you know, getting out in the world and touring and stuff, you're able to, you know, you find your people. You find your yeah, people, yeah. and that's. I think that's. There's something to be said for that. Uh, so going back to to those early days. I feel like there's always been a through line through Jushu that uh, the instrumentation ch almost changes with the creativity, but which which drives oh, yeah, yeah, one? For, for sure. like, which comes first? Is it, is it like, hey, you know, I've got this crazy, you know, insert <laughs> esoteric instrument here. Let's use that. Or is it like, wow, we need something that sounds like this. And, we, and you find it's thing. 50 50. I mean, mm -hmm. I was uh, before I got I was much more of a of an engine engineer, recording engineer before I really got into songwriting. Um, right. And not that I have ever become particularly great at it, but like making a crazy sound is as aesthetically interesting to me as, you know, harmony lyrics or or melody is. Um, so as as often as not, there'll be a crazy sound. And it, you know, does something to me emotionally. And I'm like, okay, well, I can't just right. fucking press this button 400 times <laughs> on the record. I've got to put it into some sort of context. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, you know, there'll be other times where there's a song and it needs, you know, we're like, we, you know, the normal way of doing things where you have a song and it needs some frosting and you put a crazy sound on it. But um, yeah, I mean, we, since we started collecting different instruments, uh has, has been a huge part of the writing process for us and and remains so i mean i think you're i mean you were the first band i could think of coming from for lack of a better term the indie rock world it was like doing like gamelon stuff and like and 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 you know really diving into those kinds of things that it wasn't tokenism it was just like no this is you could check out what you can do with this you know this this is yeah yeah like the, the uh percussion uh from the very beginning and still is you know i mean, I mean percussion outside of the drum set percussion um, right right yeah, yeah. Uh, right yeah, it, it, massively influential for us and it wasn't it wasn't so much that we tried to play gamelon but we were very interested in how gamelon music is structured so we tried to emulate the structures of it and uh and then also you know using tuned metal percussion uh right was also hugely influential on us and so we have a enormous we probably have more, more than 100 
Kongs at this point. <laughs> well, and it reminds me of how the residents would do it too, where it's sort of like there's respect towards how it's used, but it's like, no, yeah, but that's not precisely how you guys are using it. You're, you're doing it in such a way of like, well, what if, what happens if you do this this way? Oh, that sounds cool. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we are influenced by it. We weren't trying to a, a, appropriate it. Right. Right. It, yeah. And I think that's, I think that's important to note in this day and age. And, and it always was something that like, like it seemed like from the beginning, there was a very, using all 64 crayons in the crayon, crayon box kind of mindset towards uh, composition and, and performance and something it, that you when, grew into. Well, it, we, when we started out, we, um, it's kind of corny, but we, we used a lot of the crayons, but we have like wrote down with a pen, not a crayon, unfortunately. <laughs> um, like what, like really like, okay, we want this band. Cause and Corey and I in some of this word, it was very o- open and we would kind of do anything. And it, right. that band had a sound, yeah. but it wasn't particularly focused. And we're like, okay, we want, it can be broad, but we want, we're going to pick five paths and try and push them together. And we literally wrote them down on a piece of paper. And since, since then we've maintained those five, initial influences and and have, have added to you know the, the box of crayons is bigger now than when we started sure yeah, yeah. It, it did we did start out with maybe 35 crayons and now we're probably at 64 crayons fair enough no fair enough but it was it was very point pointedly very specific crayons. we'd like to welcome our new sponsor crayola crayons yes <laughs> <laughs> that what a, how cool would that be to have them as a sponsor you're sponsored It'd by be spe- by crayons, amazing. I listen, to, I listen to a ton of podcasts. I have bad insomnia, so they kind of help me fall yeah, asleep. Yeah. I have never heard them sponsor anybody. They should. Have, I've I have never taken a sponsor aggressively. No ads, no sponsors. But but if Crayola crayons called, That's I gotta very say, forgivable. That's, I I think you gotta say yes who to Crayola. Give shit about that? <laughs> There's We're, nothing unpunk rock about <laughs> Crayola crayons sponsoring your art rock. I podcast. mean, who's yeah, like. Like that's amazing. The Crayola Crayola sponsored by Crayola, Crayola Crayons. Fuck yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, you just have to you just have to bring up the analogy every show. That's the trade. <laughs> and I feel like I do it a lot anyway. Which it seemed very natural when you did it here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It didn't right. seem like you were pushing it at all. Well, yeah, and it's uh and it's like a brand that's like no one's going to get mad at Crayola Crayons, you mm-hmm. know. Like, they're not going to have like some some horrible controversy. <laughs> Yeah. I hope not. I, oh God! That's, I mean, I don't want they, to speak that they into the world. They got rid of the flesh-colored crayon and called the peach. So they kind oh, of. Oh, that's right! I forgot about that. They, you know, I mean, not cool to have done it, but they realized the error of their ways. Yeah, they more them. than forty years ago. Um, <laughs> right. So they're well out of the game, as right, far right. as as uh, being respectful of what people actually are. Absolutely, absolutely. Peaches. That's what people actually are. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so so move on. Uh, so Chapel. You want to move on? Yeah. yeah. From, from Crayola Crayons, yeah. Okay. Ch- Chapel of the Chimes, that was the one you did a uh, ceremony on. Uh, yes. That, that was, um, and of course, there's an, for people that are not Bay Area centric, there is an actual Chapel of the Chimes, which is gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a chain um, of, the one in Oakland is particularly beautiful. My mom works at the one in Sacramento. Oh, there's multiple um, ones, really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, oh wow, they're all in the Bay Area, but it's it's like a or a way where I, they probably still are, but it's like a chain of funeral homes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. That you know, I somehow knew and forgot that, but I only I but, always but think the of one in Oakland, Oakland is very special and right. very unusual. The other ones all just sort of look like you know whatever normal mausoleums and stuff, but the Oakland one is spectacular. It's 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 particularly beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Uh so there's the. So there's that EP that has the Joy Division uh, cover. Joy Division, of course, being something that, you know, I, I recall men- mentioning Joy Division in a sentence when I described what Jushu sounded like with a, amongst fair. five or six other things. Uh, yeah, huge, huge, huge influence on us and still are. One of my, I, we just on this last, uh, last time we toured England this year, we finally went to Ian Curtis's grave. So even now, still right. important to us. I mean, you could do worse, right? Oh, indeed. <laughs> Timeless, perfect music. Oh, okay, yeah, that's yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then there's also uh, um, Zach. Zach Hill does some some bells or something on that, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, from... yeah. We had a uh, we toured the first long tour we did 
was with uh, all five or C bands and Hella at the time was on, this was the band he was in before Death Grips, um, was on five or C. And actually we just, I think I just had like a little like Sony Walkman and we, he just, I just played in the song yeah. on headphones and then we was in a, it was in the parking lot of the last show on the tour, which is in Reno. And I just set up the thing and he, I think he played some of our rocks. <laughs> cells and then we just synced it up in, in, uh, in Pro Tools. But he's, he's a wonderful guy. Uh, incredibly sweet, super talented, hardworking. Any nice thing you've ever heard about him is true. Yeah, we uh, we played with a couple of those early Hella shows with him. Which oh, cool. I, which I kind of forgot about until I had Marnie Stern on recently. And sort of this oh, right on. That's that, great. Who was amazing. And it kind of like knocked some of the dust loose from the rafters of those. I was like, oh, yeah, we totally played with them a bunch early on. <laughs> like at a cafe in, in Elk Grove and things like that, where it's like, oh, yeah. Oh, wild. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, yeah, amazing town. And, 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 oh, and I drove. Elk Grove is not amazing. My family was. Elk there. Grove is not amazing at all. No, 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 no. My <laughs> uncle lives there. But the show was amazing. Uh, oh, good, good. I drove Greg down to play the first and one of the only Nervous Cop shows, the one where it's him and. Um... Oh, wow, right. I forgot about Nervous Cop. That's so cool. Yeah. And I just was, and he was like, just looking for a ride. I'm like, I ain't doing anything. I'll drive you down. That's nice. Of <laughs> so you. that's how I got to see Nervous Cop. Oh, man. God, I forgot about that. <laughs> that, that. That record is so out. It's pretty wild, man. It, yeah. it's, 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 it's sort of like. I was there and I was like, I can't, I, I can't really believe this is happening. Cause it's like, cause both those guys have such a unique style. What was it like? What was it like live? Did it do two It was drums cool. Or... Yeah. They yeah. both played drums. They set up their drums, like, like facing each other. And uh -huh. I, and it was, I, all I can say is it sounded like what you think it's going to sound like, but it was, it was a trip. Cause it reminded me of like, well, I mean, when people talk about the great jazz uh, lineups, the jazz combos and stuff, and you get to see them play, and you're like, "Wow, I saw something special that like I will never see again." Like that's that's how it felt. And oh, that's cool. I'm that sure was a, it was. I'm sure it was like that. That's great. That that was that's uh, such a good band name too. Nervous, Co I know it, it, it's aged well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's, that's so good. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> They have a well. You have the other Zach on there too. You have you have Zach Wentz on there on that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't, it, oh, I didn't know you knew him. Yeah, he's a, yeah. He's a wonderful cat. I, I have I haven't kept up with them. I should I should. He's he's doing all right in Good. San Diego still. Yeah, still doing music. Yeah. I just got out of he's the habit playing. of playing San Diego, so I don't remember any of my San Diego. And then it gets to the point where we're like, uh, I don't even know how to play San Diego anymore. And then it just becomes a thing. But yeah, really, really uh, great yeah, player. He's, great he's a great guy. Yeah, super creative. But talk to me about a promise, right? So this is uh, you, you got. Um, that's one that's uh, Sad Pony Gorilla Girl. That's the. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's the well originally an earlier iteration of that was a Ten of the Swear Girls Swear mm -hmm. song, um, but it has Fast Car, the OG Fast Car. How how were you? You heard about that whole thing, right? With that recent. The thing, the recent thing with Fast Car, where the guy, the, the country dude. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I I heard, I heard, I heard. I just assumed it was a regular song people covered. Is it? Not, what's what's the? I know it was recently recovered. This was something particular about it. So it was first of all very popular, and it's. Uh, I think it won an award or something. I don't know. I don't pay much attention to like that style of country music. Is probably the nicest way I can put that. Um, but it like hit the charts and like people started giving him praise. It's like it's like you know that's a Tracy Chapman song, right? Like that was a <laughs> that was oh, like oh, oh, people didn't realize it was a cover, uh, uh, right? I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And um, I don't even know who this guy is, but basically, in, the, the country audience didn't know who Tracy Chapman was. And anyway, it was like, oh weird. It was such yeah. a huge song. I just Which I feel like it was ubiquitous, right? But I guess if yeah, all, yeah, yeah. if all you listen to is uh... oh okay, I mean I guess it did come out fucking. 30 years ago, I guess yeah. it's understandable. Yeah. And if all you listen to is pickup truck music, you know, I mean, I don't yeah. know. Uh, but that's, that's, that's got your, your cover of Fast Car in there as well, uh, which is such a cool song. And I remember when you did that, I was like, are they freaking covering Tracy Chapman? <laughs> <laughs> well, when it, when it, um, when it first came out, how old are you? Uh, I just turned 46 earlier this month. Okay. Did you watch 120 Minutes as a kid? Hell yeah. I did. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it used to be, for people who 
didn't watch it or might be a little younger. I'm MT when MTV still did a bunch of videos. I hate saying that makes me it's crazy. Like a... First of all, MTV used to play music. Also, there yeah. were specialty shows that were where they allowed the weirdos in. <laughs> On Sunday nights, they played. There was a show called 120 Minutes, and this was before Nirvana sort of made alternative music no longer alternative music. So things were. Uh, you know, like people into metal and people into hip hop and people into goth did not hang out and did not listen to each other's musics until Nirvana. So 120 Minutes was a show that was, you know, just like the Cure and PIL and, um, you know, art, art rock stuff, New Order and things like that were on it. Um, and at the time, initially, Fast Car was on 120 Minutes. That was the first place that they ever played the video because the video is really pretty goth. It is. And the lyrics of the song are essentially about a bunch of horrible things happening. The end, like nothing, nothing sorts out. It's just a succession of a terrible life. And then the song is over. Um, right. So it, it, it made sense for that audience. And that it's was like a Lars von Trier movie or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> uh, so when I was a kid, I mean, I saw that, you know, alongside of, you know, like after that would be just like heaven would be on or something like right, that. Right. Um. So, when, you know, and this, I was very, very young at the time and, you know, getting into any kind of, any kind of music was interesting to me as a kid. Um, so uh, when we were working on that record, it was a particularly horrible time in my life and in Corey's life. Um, and the song is just, a, you know, like I just said, it's just about terrible things happening yeah. with no resolution, which was a reflection of what was happening and what our, our lives were like at the time. Uh, so it, in, in addition to it having been something that I heard as a kid and resonated with me, it remained super relevant, uh, per, like even, even more relevant as I became older and understood the ramifications of what a fucking horrible life <laughs> yeah. can be. Uh, so that's, that's why we explored it. Well, totally. I, it, I, it wasn't that different, right? <laughs> it no, wasn't no, that no. different from the rest a of it. Straight, a pretty straight version. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I haven't, I haven't listened to the original version in a long time. Although I did hear a Muzak version of it in a grocery store, maybe two years ago, which is really funny to me. Well, um, apparently if you're like turning on the it, most depressing songs of all time. In the grocery store, for, right? <laughs> like marketing for potato chips. Well, just like, uh, what was the, uh, that Iggy Pop song they used for, uh, that, that cruise liner and was like, have you listened to the lyrics of the song? <laughs> Do you know what you're advertising right now? I mean, I'm yeah. here for it. It's very weird and cool, but like, I think someone's not a lyrics guy that decided no. to put this in yeah. there. <laughs> uh, was, was that was that the first one with Chess with Chess Smith? No, he played on Knife Play. Okay. Uh, okay. He he I, he and Greg actually faced each other and played on uh, nice. did a, did a Nervous Cop thing. They played on a song called Hives Hives. Um, on my play uh but chess uh so yeah so he's he'd been doing stuff with this since the beginning as that's great he he used to work at the andronicos across the street from my place in berkeley oh my god <laughs> wow you you're deeply involved yeah and, and i used to see him all the time and we would like bs about music and and for a long time i didn't realize he was a musician and then he's like oh yeah i'm a band called god god's in kansas and I'm like oh you're in a band i had no idea that makes sense because like you know every band that i know can i'm like you know, strolling up in like a birthday party T-shirt and, and like you know nice. buying my salad or whatever, and, <laughs> and it was like, oh, of course, we've been talking for years about music. Of course, you're in a goddamn band, and then it's like, oh my god, you're an incredible drummer. Jesus Christ, what what a yeah, great yeah. what a great player. He's a he's a wonderful, it's incredibly inspiring player. So the so I feel like that's one that uh, oh that's the one that has the um, the. The, the the sex worker cover right like the mm -hmm. the with the with the doll like it's a doll upside down if I remember I should look it up um pretty bold image was was that uh, how did you decide for the artwork for that one because I remember that being kind of like m minor controversy at the time like people were like Whoa. um I had a couple of years before I had basically just recorded every terrible high school third wave ska band in san jose in order to save money uh and with this money i had planned on taking a trip to vietnam it was the first you know right. sort of big trip i had taken by myself ever yeah um and and you know and at the time uh it had 
Vietnam had only been open to Americans for maybe like a year or something. Yeah. Um, I mean, now it's totally, you know, you can go there as a tourist, like in you know most other places. But it was more of like a rarefied trip at the time. Um, and uh, it, it's it's sort of an insanely long story. But anyway. This is an insanely long show, man. Go ahead. Okay. So I was, in, <laughs> I was in Hanoi. It was towards the end of the trip. And I had read in this guidebook that there was this gay cruising lake in Hanoi. And I certainly wasn't going to hire a sex worker in a foreign country, you know, that I you know have you know I have no idea what the law is like or I certainly did not want to go to jail but I just <laughs> wanted to you see imagine? Oh my God. No. Uh, Actually no. apparently I could have imagined because I pointedly said you can look but you may not touch. Um so I just wanted to see what the vibe was. Yeah yeah, uh, yeah. so this uh man like within seconds this man approached me and asked me if I wanted to hang out and I was you know, I was on the trip alone, so I figured, yeah. you know, why not? Um, we got a couple beers, and he asked me if I wanted to go back to the hotel room. And on this trip, to sort of have a little art project to keep from, I don't know, to sort of feel a little bit moored and to have give me something to do, I brought this little rubber baby along, and you know, blot the, you know, I put the rubber baby in the field, take a picture, put the, you know, put the rubber baby in the jungle, take a picture, put it next to this beautiful the omelet i'm gonna eat right exactly yeah you know so not that there are yeah. other examples of that but i think of omelet because i like that movie. exactly yeah yeah so he asked me if i want to go back to the hotel room and i said i said okay sure but i don't i don't want to have sex but how do you feel about posing with this rubber baby doll and he was just like okay like i mean i'm sure that people ask him to do much weirder <laughs> shit than this like that's probably not in the top 20 of weirdest things he yeah. seemed completely nonplussed so um we went to the hotel the little hotel um and he asked if he could use a shower and it was at night when we met and i once we were in the room and there was more light i could see that he his he was living a little rough like his clothes are pretty dirty and yeah it seemed like he like a shower would he needed a shower um so, you know, and when he took off his clothes and I could see like he had like a lot of it seemed like he had been had a rough life. He had like a what looked like a lot of cigarette burns on his body. Yeah. And, um, so uh, I felt and still do feel very mixed about it. But I just said, OK, and I just gave him the doll and he just started. I didn't direct him. He just started posing and he started initially like he did some kind of sexy poses and. And some just sort of like sitting with it and stuff. It probably was like over like 10 minutes or something. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, feeling weird and guilty. He asked for a particular amount of money. And I feel like feeling weird and guilty. I gave him like a ton more money than that. Right. Um, and uh, only feeling guilty because, uh, I mean, I don't think, I didn't feel like I did anything that we didn't discuss. I certainly, but, you know, it, it was a strange situation um and i i mean for somebody who fucks other people for a living to be like i i couldn't tell if it was more objectifying or less objectifying or like he it, he didn't yeah. seem bugged by it but also i didn't have no idea what was going on in his heart and mind so um i hope it was yeah. totally fine for him um uh and then you know and then then he said, okay, well, I'll see you tomorrow. And I was thinking like, I don't know why. Uh, and then uh, I think he just figured, okay, this guy seems down. This is this um, guy's thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, he, he again, probably not with, top 20 of weirdest thing. Probably not at with all. That week. Yeah. I, probably not at all. Considering how nonplussed he was about the whole thing. Um, and then, I mean, this was a few years before a promise came out. And then, I mean, I took, I don't know, several hundred photos on that trip and, maybe 20 of him this gentleman's name was hang of hang um and i looked at him and we needed to cover and um there wasn't a whole lot of thought that went into it other than it's just a striking image yes um the initial cover was not censored and slim from kill rockstar called me and said we can do it on you could see his dick um in right. the photo in the original photo he said you, we can do it like that but like 90% of retail outlets won't carry it. 
which was the thing was, we have to remember at the time. Uh, yeah. If you weren't in a store, it, it, it wasn't like, Oh yeah, there wasn't, yeah, there wasn't really a way to get it. Otherwise that's right. Again, I feel like um, I have to establish this context every time we're talking about. Yeah. I think iTunes might've, it might not even really exist. People didn't really use it at the time. And yeah. maybe the next year people use it more. Yeah. It was starting to like come together, but it's still a little was, bit, but it was, yeah. It was, um, if it, it had to be, it wasn't in stores and you weren't on tour, then they wouldn't be able to get it. That was, yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the dick was not the point of the photo. It was more. A, it was a his, person. Yeah. His per, yeah. His, his, it was about him, not about his dick. So it was sort of very easy to go. Okay, well, we'll just cover it up. And I had, I had just seen um, storytelling by Todd Solons. And there was, <sighs> there was a scene in storytelling where a kind of a very intense sexual scene. And the, 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 mo the movie was going to get an X rating or an NC-17 rating, which similarly meant that it would exist, but you couldn't see it. Right. So Todd Solon's put an orange rectangle over the. Sex oh, that's scenes. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then, and so it was, like, and it was an homage. Of, so we put an orange rectangle over Hank's uh, cock. Um, and I remember driving home. I was working in Oakland at the time. I was no, where I was living in Oakland, but working in San Jose, mm -hmm. and driving in horrible traffic. And someone from Kill Rockstars called me to ask me how I wanted to deal with uh, while I was driving stupidly on the phone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> asked me how I wanted to deal with it. And then I remembered talking to them about it. Uh, and also at the time I had a horrible van and the headlights were fucked up and they were pointed down. So I could only see about five feet in front of the van. That happened with another, my, with my first van for a while to be on the phone. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And like, I was like, I have to learn how to fix this. Cause this is not, yeah. gonna, I don't have the money no. to have someone fix it, but this is literally dangerous. No, yeah. that's, that's, Made more so by the fact that I was talking, talking on the phone, phone. Was <laughs> in horrible traffic on the 880 or whatever for very long. Oh, no, I'm anyway, not doing so anything. that's the yeah. long story. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's, it's I, I remember it kind of playing out at, at the time. And, you know, I can only imagine what those conversations would be like now. I don't want to imagine them. Uh, but But I feel like... I think it was, it was very clear that it was not coming from any place of exploitation. I feel mixed about it and felt mixed about it at the time. Um, I mean, part of me doesn't feel like it was exploitative. Uh, in the moment, it did not feel like it was. Right. But I could see how somebody could take it that way. I mean, the point was not to do anything. I mean, he said yes to everything. Yeah. He seemed, he didn't seem freaked out. Um, it was over quickly. I didn't do anything that I didn't say. You know, well, I it wasn't like, like you were trying to, to just do a salacious activity for, to no, get, I mean, generate I mean, controversy. I was it was a piece of the art from like a weird art project. Yeah. Um, and I, but I don't know how he feels about it or felt about it. And obviously, there was no way I could ask him if we could have him on the cover. Right. Um, but then, I mean, at the time, I had no idea what the internet would become. I mean. I assumed there would be no way in a billion years he would ever know. And there, you know, um, I can't imagine he would think to Google himself for if, am I on an album cover? Let's see. You know, so I'm sure he probably doesn't know. I mean, I have no idea what his life is like now. I don't know. Um, yeah. That's so, yeah. If I, you know, I, I, I still feel mixed about it. Part of me thinks it was totally fine. And part of me uh, could, could see the argument in the other way too. I think musically, that's the one where it kind of seemed like it really started to come together as far as uh, as a fully realized unit and a, as a band and as an artistic statement. That's the one I was like, oh, this is powerful. Like, not just because of the album cover. I'm talking about like a, a music wise. And I remember being impressed with not just the song and the title, but Ian Curtis Wishlist. Like I thought that was like a really I was like, that's an interesting way of looking at that. Like and it, it was something that. I think there was always sort of an undercurrent of uh, the cure at their most sort of intellectual and dreamy uh, to some of what you were doing. But I felt like it really was a almost a statement of intent record. I don't know if it was meant to be that way or not, or things were just getting comfortable. But did anything feel different about the songs on that record at the time? I, I don't want to like over glamorize uh, what our fucked up life was like but like we didn't have anything in mind okay i mean it was it was a lot just about uh, okay
okay, let's make some music. Uh, there, there wasn't really any <laughs> conscious decisions being made yeah. um, at that time. Uh, so if, if, if that record worked out, it was just luck and the goddess of music being generous with us smiling um, upon you <laughs> yeah well, i mean we we were we were just trying to get through the day uh, i mean and i'm 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 not again not trying to be itself a grand item, but it, it really was a particularly awful period of living then yeah and that's you know, I don't like people fetishizing bad times for making good art, but you know there is. Some... It's not. I don't think making good art. I don't think having a shitty life is even conducive to making good. I art. I don't think I so think either. It, yeah, I think it disrupts the opportunity to make good art. If I'm really yeah. depressed, I can't fucking do anything. Same. Um, so good. Uh, having art, I think, uh, prevented us from putting a, you know, Corey and me from putting a gun in our mouths. Yeah. I mean good art prevented something shitty from happening. It didn't make something good happen. Right. Right. Well, I, I, I think it's, it, it, for that record, I felt like there was finally a record that you could point to people like, yeah, listen to that. Like, see if you, see if you dig that, you'll probably, you'll probably like this band if you like this record. And that at the time, I remember thinking at the time, I was like, this is either going to be the last record they make or the first of many. <laughs> <laughs> like I remember because I was listening to it, I was like, this is so like it's intense. It's intense in a way that not like Seasons of the Abyss is intense, right? Like it's it's like, no, this is so emotionally like it's not an everyday listener. But it's does the thing it does so well that if you're in a proper uh, receptive mindset, it's a quite it's quite a ride. Oh, thanks. Um I I've been uh, I, I think just because we've been around for a little while, um, we uh, toured a lot this year for the first time since the pandemic, but like toured a crazy amount this year. Yeah, yeah, you've been. Very and busy. we're really kind of surprised by um, with with people who are, yeah, I'm in my mid forties at this point, but but with people who are younger and come to shows, that seems to be yeah. the record that people really attach themselves to. And it wasn't like that before. I think it's just been in the last. Um, in the last couple of years, it seems to be one that um, that people uh, are attached to. I mean, I feel extraordinarily grateful that anything we worked on ever, right. people listen to ever. It's a minor um, miracle but, anyone connects with anything at all, to be clear. Uh, I <laughs> agree. Um, I feel very, very lucky. Uh, but yeah, we, we are all surprised that, I mean, because it's, it's, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's songs on it, but a lot of it is very obtuse. It is obtuse. Um. Uh, yeah. So anyway, yeah. Um, it, I think it fits it, it, the Zoomer sensibility, though. Like, not that like you can sum up an entire generation of people like with a with a name, but I feel like that that might be there's certain there's a certain open heartedness to it that I think is like vibes with a lot of younger listeners. I would it, postulate as a middle aged uh, yeah. dude. Yeah. <laughs> We, I mean, we try not to look into that stuff or be analytical. About yeah, yeah, don't bother. I mean, it's just going to, but uh, um, anyway, if anyone have, has ever checked that record out, genuine thanks. Regardless of your age. Right, right. It's, if you're it's... young and cute, or if you're middle-aged and saggy. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> so everyone is welcome. Uh, Fabulous Muscles is the next one. And that's sort of like... I feel like there was like more synth pop sensibility kind of coming into that, like in a good way. You know, that that was that was the one that was sort of like, oh wow, cool. They're 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 bringing that in. And uh, tell me, I mean, th not that it's like a light fare though. There's still like you know, abuse, addiction, depression, <laughs> all the normal uh, the normal things that you, you one would expect. Uh, but tell me about it, it, was that still just reflection of the of life being kind of not amazing yeah it was i mean we all those records were made in a pretty short period of time yeah um so uh it, it was a pretty similar like head down pushing forward just trying to get through things mindset 
I mean, uh, that record is pro probably the reason that we have been able to s still put out records now is probably that, that record is kind of the one that made us, um, we, I don't know. We went from there being 20 people at shows to maybe a hundred people at shows because of that record. Sure. Um, uh, but it, I mean, we, it, I mean, we weren't trying to do that. It's just, those are just the songs that came out. I mean, since we started, we are always really interested in, in synth pop and drum machines and, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it at really at almost no point in the history of Sheep's Shooters there ever been a lot of conscious thought going into anything <laughs> we have ever done. It's just sort of what ends up, sure, you know, happening happening at the time. Um, and that's just the record that happened to have, have gotten made. I'm sure we would be much more successful if we put any fucking thought into anything we ever did. Um, but it's just not how we operate. <laughs> it's just not how you roll, man. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I remember. I love the Valio just being like, but I first heard, heard that I was like, I was like, oh wow, like it's that's I did not expect this, I'm, but I'm, I'm ready always, for it. I'm always really surprised because that I mean, this it's like it, it's just like three verses, like there's no this, there's no chorus or anything like yeah. that. <laughs> but that seems that seems to be a song that that uh, people still seem attached to, which of course I'm very grateful for. But I'm just you know when you think of what a you know pop song structure is, it's not that song. Yeah, but I also think of like, um, like PIL, right? Death Disco. Yeah, oh, yeah. That, you that's, know? Yeah. I mean, what, that, what that, is that, that song? That's true. That's true. There's, there's, <laughs> plenty, know, there's, like... plenty of, there's plenty of things. But I remember I, I, the first time I, I had, was on a solo tour with Devendra Banhart, and I, about halfway through the tour, started playing that song. Yeah. And even in just like a guitar and vocal version, he was like, you have to put that on the next record because it had been a Ten of the Swear Jar song. And the Time of the Swear Jars version is totally different. Very different, yeah. Um, and I just was just, you know, I had been on this tour and just was trying to think of other songs that I could play and uh, that I knew. And he and he said, you got to put that one on the next record, which I had not even thought about doing. Um, so anyway, it it seems to, it seems, he, he, he is an astute person and it was, it was good advice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's, a, I mean, but, but again, it's still, you know, the, the, the themes of their of this record like it still sticks to what you're oh yeah i mean it, it's it's not a lighthearted record in any way <laughs> no not at all but there's but there's some there's some grooves on it so yeah yeah well and that was that was definitely like it didn't seem like outside the box or anything necessarily it just was like i was like oh that's interesting i didn't expect that cool uh and i think that um it's consistent, you know. There's nothing to be said. There's something to be said for that, I, and I, yeah, it does. It did seem, it did seem like that's when things sort of started to uh, get a little bigger or a little more like uh, finding yeah, more yeah, of the yeah. audience. I mean, not way. like not like night and day, but it was right. it, basically at that point I was able to quit my day job, right? Um, and you know, I mean, I live like a, I mean a. I could I could squeak by. I made as much as I made at my day job, which was almost nothing. But I was like, <laughs> okay, I mean, I could be in a band or work at this job. So yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, God, for giving me this option. <laughs> right. And so you know, and then by some miracle, I've been able to keep it up since then. And that's still um, what Lauren Jarek. Uh... Oh, at that point, uh, that was when Carol Lee started touring. Carol Lee okay. McElroy. Got it. Okay. That was that came in two thousand four, and yeah, and she she toured for four years. Who um, she also oh, and then she, she, she toured in she Cold also, Cave, right? If, she was in Cold Cave. Yeah, yeah. she she quit. She should have started playing on Cold Cave. We we always loved each other very much, but really did not get along. Um, it was she's an extraordinarily good musician. Yeah. Um, not like a flashy technical player, but her feel is superb and always like her heart is always there all the time um and it was very very apparent but you know i mean i am still insane but i was fucking crazy then <laughs> and she was equally nuts uh so it was just you know we were just constantly constantly fought like i don't know it was pretty miserable for both of us oh man to her credit like the, and i've i've probably said this in interviews a bunch of times before but 
we would be like this was not a rare occurrence like we would be walking on stage and she would go fuck you i hate your fucking guts i wish you were gonna die and then like but she would throw down every hey, night. everybody like, <laughs> i mean <laughs> it, never music. Became, it never became <laughs> hey, everybody but like yeah yeah her us having a shitty time together never prevented her from putting for, her from doing the show it. yeah yeah and i had since played with other people who uh you know who I thought were real musicians who, if they were in a bad mood, I mean, would phone it in and, and Carly never, ever, ever, ever phone it in regardless. Sorry, that of, was a very natural reaction. Sorry. I didn't mean to pass judgment immediately, but. Ugh, oh you know, no, no. Pass I'm, judgment. Phoning it in is complete bullshit. Yeah. Like, um, and you know, I don't play with those people anymore. So, um, yeah. but yeah, so, and then chess joined that lineup in, uh, 2006. So it was chess, Carly and me, um, from, uh, so Carly from 2004 to 2008 and then chess from in recording, but I mean, touring, we, we didn't actually tour right. together for that long. Um, just from 2006 to 2008, but we had recorded together and done a bunch of auxiliary stuff, continue to do that. Yeah. I mean, there was a live record you did, right. There was, a uh, the Italian, uh, Oh, that was just like a saying? solo, like a, I, that, I always forget about that. That was just from some solo shows. Okay. I, I, yeah. I think I actually have a CDR. Of it oh, somewhere, yeah. <laughs> like in the probably back over there, <laughs> but it's not like a real. It's not a real. Yeah, I, I remember it just record. being like a, a uh, yeah. It's a, some like it was like, interspersed with, with Fag Patrol, I think. With right? Fag Patrol, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why that. I mean, it was nice that those people put it out, but it's not like I forgot until you mentioned it that that record. Yeah, we we wouldn't call it an essential part of the no uh, no the, the, that part. Uh, you did the the um. So back, sorry, back to Fabulous Muscles, uh, the Dennis Cooper thing, right? The the, um, the Ashgrave. Oh uh, yeah, Ashgrave yeah, yeah. Uh, man, this is a while ago. Uh, sorry, I'm, yeah, I yeah, yeah. I think I, I, I think we there was just a, a song that was on Fabulous Muscles that ended up on that. It's funny that you mentioned because Dennis Cooper is mad at me. Um, we oh, were friends really? for a while, but he's he's mad at me. So, um, oh. it's okay. I. I can understand why he'd be mad. Anyway, I wish him well. <laughs> All right. Well, moving on. <laughs> so tell me about um, uh, the fourth record. Uh, what's oh, La Laferay. Yeah, Laferay. Uh, which uh, that's, you, you have John Dietrich in there, right? So that's. Yeah, a... John Dietrich. Uh, yeah, John Dietrich plays on it. Chess is on that. Corey is on that. That's the first record. Corey stopped touring after Knife Play, but still worked on the records. Right. Um, and that was the last record that he was in was he was involved in. Um, I miss working. I still really miss working with him a lot. Uh, he said, like, because we had been through so much shit, I could really be unguarded with him, uh, especially right, doing vocal. Yeah. He 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 like later became, essentially became like a producer. Um, and uh, I could he could uh, I think as we had worked together so much, it was it was it's a lot of unspoken naturalness in our work thing and he could he could get vocals out of me that's a good but point I, because with you if you're doing something for lack of a better term so unguarded you need someone that you feel comfortable with but someone that's oh yeah like the dividing line between like okay that's intense but it's not good <laughs> or that's like good but like it's not there yet if they, if they, like it, it's yeah like he, it's he vital me well right? enough as a person and I knew him well enough as a person that I could be open hearted around him. Yeah. But he also knew when I would was not there yet or if I was not focused or right. if I was trying but kind of pretending to get it. Um I mean he could always tell the difference. Can call uh, and also, can call you know, BS he, as needed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean he he never did it in a shitty way. But yeah, no, no, like, no. I'm he's just like keep going, you know, dig deeper, it's that's not it, or or you know, or I would try something kind of ridiculous and he'd just be like just don't be so show don't tell you know well um, it's it's also if you have someone that's an intense musician in, in what they do like having someone as a sounding board right to be able to tell you like even give you any feedback of any kind whatsoever oh yeah it's, you know it's, it's vital i couldn't i right. could there's, there's always been through the whole life of the band there's always been somebody who had that role which is the role that angela saw has now yeah um, sure yeah 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 but yeah like i can't 
I think I'm, I don't, I, I don't know. I like, I can make like 80% of a song, but I, I could never really finish it. Like I always, I always need somebody um, for a long time. It was Corey. And a lot of times it's been Greg and sometimes John Congleton. Sure. And, uh, oh, and, so uh, and always, uh, and always Angela to sort of really fin- finish it up or tie the loose ends together. Um, but yeah, La, La Farade, that was, so we had, uh, I, I got out of the $200, apartment i was living in in seattle which was horrendous and moved to oakland that's when i moved to oakland <laughs> right right and i had had it was the first time i ever lived in a place that was not a nightmare to live in um like i lived by myself i had just this like kind of cute little one bedroom in fruitvale yeah i just like oh, a fruitvale. Yeah. a sense of a, astonishing relief that um i mean i was still feeling fairly horrible but like the i was not broke I was not living someplace hor- horrifying. Yeah. I wasn't living with someone who hated me. Um, like some some sort of ter- terrestrial aspects of my external life, uh, just kind of through uh, luck and a certain amount of stubbornness on my part, kind of started to be a little less horrible. So La Ferre was a little bit more about, although still a pretty torn apart record, was a little bit more about uh ref, ref, kind of reflecting on the you know maybe the last five or six years of my life which were really bad rather than being in the, the middle of it well and that's uh was it 2005 right that was uh 2005 yeah entering the second bush term you know that was yeah a... it was a great time <laughs> yeah it was uh yeah the 21st century america has really been doing fucking awesome <laughs> We've been doing great work, and it's super it's, good. Been, it's super been a good. good time doing it. A lot to be proud of. <laughs> well, that one's got you know, it's got the vibraphone. There's some clarinets, there's some strings on there. I think there's like oh yeah, ben, harmonium. Ben, uh, ben Goldberg on there, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of kind of cool ear candy uh, with that one. A lot of unique sounds. I think that. Uh, I think I think that's a good record. I think that's a that's a it's a weird time to be doing anything. I guess it's a weird time to be doing anything anytime though, right? But I, I remember two thousand five just being like, it seemed like there was a lot of tumult, especially in the uh, uh, on uh, the early end of that, which is what we deal with weekly now. So whatever. What am I even talking about? I mean, uh, but that record is um, yeah. I mean, how do you feel about that record? I think that's an interesting record. That's cool. uh, it's just getting it's just got it's getting reissued and. February. Oh, nice. Um, awesome. On yeah, Kill Rock Stars is doing it, which is nice. Oh yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, it's, it's never had like a good. It had a really like a low quality vinyl pressing like 15 years ago, but it's like finally like a good, well mastered 180 gram vinyl. That's awesome. Um, so I'm I'm glad. Um, yeah, I don't. I mean, I it's hard for me to have to put forth any kind of assessment on our records. Like I just yeah. I I kind of put everything. Sorry to be so corny. I mean, I try and put everything I can into making a record and then just move on to the next one. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. It's kind of, I think it's sort of, Oh, you know, like a little bit of a dark horse record. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's the last record we've had get reissued. If that's an indication of how it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's sort of, uh, but uh, you know, I mean, uh, I've, I've, I feel, I feel proud to have made any record ever. So, yeah, yeah, I absolutely. give Lafrey a big hug. I hope it's doing good wherever that's also, it's floating around. That's also got a uh, Devin also for good for cows. He's on there. He does a little double bass on there. If I, remember. I just remember that. I don't know if Devin Hoff is on my B list for the rest of my life. I don't want to talk about Devin Hoff anymore. Fair enough. How about the Air Force? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, that's Greg. Greg did that one, the, right? He was, he yeah, was, that was the first record that Greg produced. Um, that record was a, a, a lot about uh, I, I, the other records were essentially about horrible things that happened to me and people I loved, and that record was a lot about horrible things that I did to other people. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, it was. I remember. Saying to Slim Moon that I 
I feel really am embarrassed that I said this at all. I'm more embarrassed I'm about to say this. But I remember saying to him, like, I feel like this record could do okay. Like, maybe put some money into marketing it. And he was like, okay. Um, so they actually kind of pushed that record quite a bit. But it kind of did the same as all of our records I've ever done. Right, right. <laughs> um, but there's some, there's, some, there's some songs on there that, that I mean, we still play uh, songs from every record. But um, I think we have. I, I think we've always played a song from the Air Force on almost every tour you've ever done. Um, it's kind of like, it's, uh, to, yeah, to, I don't know. It, it reminds me a little bit of. It's so fraught for me to say this, but a little bit of the Smiths, I guess. And, and I. Understand. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think it musically sounds like the Smiths no, so much. No, but no, certainly, no, no, no. Yeah, I mean, but certainly, I mean, until I realized the true horror of his actual nature i mean morrissey was a tremendous <laughs> influence on my vocals and on my and on my lyric writing um actually there's a we quote a smith song on us on a song on that called uh pineapple versus the watermelon or watermelon versus the pineapple i think it's pineapple versus watermelon um yeah pineapple from, versus uh, the watermelon yeah from uh panic in the streets of london we, yeah yeah we, i mean we still align from that so yeah i mean this the smith's until fairly recently were one of my main influences and particularly that Morrissey, like his, his then use of, of, of humor in the, in the yeah. face of, uh, of rottenness is, you know, something that we have and, uh, and, clearly, clearly emulated. And it sucks that that is and now very much so on that record. That's astute. That, well, that, 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 that's kind of what I was, what I was driving at with it. And, and then like, it sucks that that is now a second or third tier reference when you <laughs> invoke the Spencer Morrissey, cause it's, he's, just uh it's it's i mean it's different than like other musicians doing shitty things i think i mean morrissey i think is a special case because it hurts it's not more like, almost right well i mean cause, okay like <laughs> lou reed a terrible guy oh yeah <laughs> but um i mean when he was younger maybe when he was older he kind of got his like his act together but you know i mean nobody talks about what a shitty guy lou reed was and says i can't listen to velvet underground anymore right but people didn't like people just were into the velvet underground because the music is fucking great. Yeah. Not because they felt like Lou Reed helped define what their emotional existence could be in a way that nobody had before. Like people didn't look to Lou Reed as, yes. a, as a guardian angel. Whereas many people, myself included for a long time, in addition to being moved by the fantastic music and lyrics really looked to Morrissey as an individual, as somebody who, you know, I felt I could understand who understood me and helped define, you know, who I was. Um, who caught it vibe wise in a way that no one else could. That nobody right? had before, <laughs> you yeah. know. So, so I, I mean, yeah, it, I think that's why it hurts more. And it's like, it's, it feels like a betrayal. Whereas yeah. when some other band, when some other artist acts like a shithead, you're just like, oh, fuck that person, they suck. Right. But I don't feel I don't take it personally. <laughs> right, right, right. Whereas right. with Morrissey, I take it very personally. So I just like I can't listen to the stuff that doesn't feel right. Well, exactly. Like you don't get as mad uh, about you know like, all right, it sucks that Van Morrison's like on the anti-vax train and really wants to talk about it. But like, the songs are good. But like, it isn't like it isn't like, oh, dude. In, yeah, in, like in that, Van Morrison didn't betray you. Van Morrison, <laughs> right? Just, just the old weird, just like, he's, rich white guy who's doing boomer stuff. Shit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah whatever. Like, yeah, you it's can kind of like just like dismiss same. it. Whereas, like, it yeah. does seem, yeah, there is an element almost like a. I mean, and I, I mean, right? if somebody can listen to the Smiths, like, I don't begrudge anybody doing it. This is just my own personal thing. Sure. Like, I don't. Um, Nick Cave said something kind of great uh, about, like, it's really hard for me to listen to music. If, if I know somebody has done something shitty. Yeah. Um, but Nick Cave's, I re read recently in a, in a uh, what was it? Oh, he did an interview with um, Rick Rubin on Rick Rubin's podcast, Tetragrammon. I listened to that. Oh, you did? Yeah. And I don't normally listen to a lot of podcasts. Peace and love, peace and love. Uh, but I, I was like, I got to listen to this, right? This is this is Rick Rubin and Nick Cave. Like, this is, gonna, yeah, this yeah. is not going to be boring. <laughs> no, it, but he, like Nick Cave said, there's just there's so many shitty things in the world and art is one of the few genuinely good things in the world. Yeah. Like don't deprive yourself of one of the few good things in the world. Art doesn't have anything to do with mm. the person that made it. Um, right. And right. actually the aforementioned John Congleton mentioned, said something about that to me. Cause we were talking about like, I can't really listen to the Scandinavian uh, um, 
death metal. Yeah. Um, for the obvious reasons, like racism and murder. <laughs> um, and he's just like, you know, that doesn't have, like the, the music is completely separate, you know, uh, like music does not people music does not come from people music comes from space and unfortunately a lot of shitty people are able to channel music and it comes out of them so just be he, he said it never bothered him because he had seen he had seen it in the studio congleton had seen it in the studio so many times yeah. that some sort of rotten person out of nowhere would do something brilliant they didn't work up to it it was just suddenly there it was, and it yeah. was trans transcendent. And that's not from a person. That's from space or the from goddess of music. Else. Well, it's, yeah. I so, mean, what are you gonna do? Like Rosemary's Baby is still an amazing movie, right? Like Chinatown's little and like Roman Polanski as a dude. Yeah, not, not great. Not so fucking cool. <laughs> not so good as it turns out. Yeah, I don't know. I feel I I feel mixed about it. Um, it, it's something I'm still kind of coming to terms with because this thing from Nick Cave was recent, right? Just kind of yeah. made me go, oh, yeah, yeah. shit, maybe, maybe there's something to that. Um, so yeah, I don't know. But I like a, the, it's, it's a different case with Morrissey though. And so yeah. for me, but again, if, if you can listen to it, that Fincher better. record, that uh, record, the Fincher re movie that came out, the killer, which is based on a graphic novel, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. I just saw it super weird that it's a bunch of Smith stuff, but also it's really kind of stuff. funny. It totally makes sense because that guy's just like a right wing fucking sociopath. It's like, obviously, he fucking likes this. <laughs> I really like the place into the music because of that. Because I'm like, well, of course, he's the kind of dude that would be that would like have it have a deep connection. That in could that listen way. to the Smiths now. Yeah. And is listening to. <laughs> yeah. Like I was like, that is I thought it was genius. I was like, it was it's, pretty brilliant. And then you got to hear these yeah. great songs, too. But they also be like, well, he's listening to it in this. And like, as, I was like, oh, that works on a whole different level. Like, I thought that was really That was really the first adept. time I had listened to the Smiths. Since, Electively. <laughs> yeah. Since, uh, it's got 2016, I think. Yeah. 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 Just, I don't and know, it, you know, and, and was like, fuck, this, this still spectacular <laughs> i yeah exactly the music's so great i had a hard time listening to sonic youth for a long time oh I, how come because like i just did not like the whole how it went down with thurston and kim i don't know them i'm not personally i know people that know them but like i but like it's it, it was impossible for me to listen to for like a few years without thinking about their marriage i'm like i don't want to think about their marriage I want to like rock out it's to these a, amazing I mean, it's, songs. It's an it's a natural reaction, and I will say I did meet Thurston Moore a few months ago, and he was incredibly sweet. Like yeah. went way out of his way to be nice. That's awesome. So I'm sorry things got ugly between him and Kim Gordon, who's equally cool. But my one interaction with him was, was delightful. Was um, well, and it's like, but yeah, but you know, I mean, it's a, it's a very it's a very human response. It's totally understandable. And I think part of it is because like they were moving and as important to you as music and that touches you in such a deep way that when it gets marred by, you know, human hideousness, it 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 affects that. Um, they, they were it's, the it's, indie it's rock power couple too. They were like, oh, it's oh yeah, and Kim. Right? You think of them as shorthand for any creative alliance between like an artistic lady and an interesting guy or, or whatever. It's any couple. It doesn't even have to be a lady and a guy. And to have that just fall apart in a very mundane way is just like, oh, yeah. I think that's that's probably the thing that bummed me out the most. I'm like, oh, that's just like every midlife crisis, dude. <laughs> you know, like it's boring. Like I wouldn't expect that to be boring. <laughs> You know, you, it's like, ah. Uh. You know, yeah, I mean, I don't know them. I don't know what they're... I don't know. And honestly, maybe I don't even want to know anything about it, but I do. And so, like, it, and, and, and I'm able to listen yeah. to Sonic Youth now. I, I was able to correct that error. Yeah. But, like, for a long time, but, I, yeah, I personally I mean, had a hard time with it just because it bubbled that's not, it's, it's not. It's not It's not. unreasonable. I think I think both uh, both responses are make sense to me. I mean, the response and that to, to separate yourself from something that right. is a drag or to just say, fuck it, music doesn't have anything to do with people. It's from space and listen to whatever you want. So. Well, the music will always be there, right? And it won't change, even if your feelings on it have changed. And just because things change and have negative associations doesn't mean that you can't, uh, you can't come back to them. Anyway, this, all this is because I, I, I said Air Force kind of reminded me of the, the Smiths. The connection between <laughs> the Air Force and the Smiths. It's an interesting thing to talk about. As a, as a, as a lifelong and deep music fan, as I'm sure we both are, Yeah. Um, it's it's a it's an important question. Sorry, my phone is going to die. i got to plug it in, so this might change the okay. angle a little. That, that, that's fine. That's fine. 
part of me. So uh, that's fine. Take your time. Take your time. It's the internet. It's okay. All right. Oh, I got. To, I have to tape it. It's gonna fucking fall down. Okay. All right. Ray duct tape, which I have handy. All right. Pardon me. Yes. Uh, Carolee does one of the vocals on that one. Yeah, right. on a song called "Hello from Eau Claire," um, which was from a, a postcard that Nadel Terizi email uh, sent to me. We toured together in two thousand five nice. nice. uh, or two thousand four. Um, yeah, we she did it in the bathroom of my apartment in Oakland. Greg was there. Um, I remember um, Greg and I both looking at each other when we were singing with the expression of damn she sounds great yeah um she did i think she did it all in one take or something she's a very very good singer i mean not like a belter or you know not like a wily singer but had a very uh very uh pure um kind of unencumbered voice and excellent pitch much better pitch than i ever had <laughs> no and it's a cool song it's just i, I remember uh I, I, is that the first issue song that didn't have you singing on it I'm trying to trying to remember. Uh, yeah. Nice. So that's different. Uh, I wish all of them didn't have me singing on it. <laughs> I don't like singing. <laughs> if I could just play guitar, I would be so happy. I think a lot of people, myself included, really like your vocals, but I also have said that exact thing before. So I totally get you, you nice. and understand. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, but I, but again, it's hard. Sometimes it is difficult for us to hear the things that people enjoy about certain aspects of what we do. So we have to, we have to realize that it is egotistical of us to. I mean, I'm not going to stop. I mean, I'm doing no, no, no. This, yeah, know? clearly, clearly. <laughs> Look, we're barely halfway through. But <laughs> whenever I don't have to in a musical setting, I am right. greatly relieved. Well, and and you are from the. I, I, when you do, you're doing it with purpose, you're doing it with direction, you're doing it with intent, and you're doing it because you have something you, you need to say to, which is the reason, the, my favorite kinds of vocals, right? Of just, even if someone isn't traditionally speaking a great, a Lou Reed, right? I mean, traditionally not a great vocalist, like if you think about it, but like, great. Not He's a great technically, vocalist. but one of the best singers oh, of all time, though. Yeah. One of my favorites, right? Yeah. But like, if you think about it in terms of like what makes a great vocalist of you know these Fakakta singing shows or something like Lou Reed would be like laughed off the stage, but it's like no, but he did music of importance that like touched people and like saved people. Yeah. So, thank you, Lou Reed. Come out next week. Kidding. Uh, but I think I think it's notable, and I think it's interesting to hear you say that because I feel like that kind of that kind of self reflection doesn't really get talked about a lot, especially for bands that have had like successful careers, you know, and uses of air quotes for the audio listeners, uh, uh, where it's, it's, you always sound very in command of what you're doing and whether it's to anyone's taste or sensibility doesn't, isn't the point. The point is you're in command of what you're doing, but there is that fine line of when you're, when you're doing something introspective and you're doing something that, um, you're pulling up something deep from yourself. You may not trust yourself as a delivery system, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, you know, maybe I'm just I projecting. Mean, I don't know. No, 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 no. It's, it's totally accurate. I sometimes feel a little silly talking about it because I feel like I'm a fucking baby. I mean, I have, I like, I, for 20 years, I've done exactly what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, so all I, all I should do is be grateful rather than go, I don't like singing. It's so tiring. <laughs> I'm so tired. I don't want to sing. <laughs> Which is it. It's just me being a whiny baby rather than just, you know, and I mean, and I would never, I mean, I would, you know, I, I, I will always, I, you know, not always succeed, but will always try my, my best to do it. Even if I. I'm very tired. I just don't want to sing. It hurts my throat. Right. I want to drink. If I can't drink, if I'm singing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I probably will. I mean, I'd say this in every interview. I just I just don't really like to think about it. Like my brain gets in the way of just 
getting a, the job done. So, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's exhausting emotionally and physically. Um, it's just not, it's not fun. I mean, also like, I'm not like technically a very good singer, so I have to, it doesn't like flow out of me. And it's you, like, you have to work at it a little bit. I to, have to, to really work yeah. at it. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's, in addition to being emotionally and physically tiring for me, it's hard still to do. Um, so anyway, lazy fucking baby, a lazy baby. <laughs> In summation, lazy baby. Uh, well, but no, I mean like, but I think that there's, there's a lot of people that are, are like that. And, and some people, when you meet them and, and they're just like, Oh, this is they they love to sing. They're great at it. They seem to don't have, they think about it at all. How lovely for them. How lucky for them. <laughs> That yeah. must be nice. How lovely. <laughs> Sounds great. But, uh, yeah, I, I think it's worth mentioning because, you know, again, all kinds of people listen to the show. And many of them are musicians. And, and some of them struggle. And then they struggle with, like, things just like that. Just to see someone like Jamie Stewart that, like, again, express something as simple as that. That can be a mind. Music word, is right? hard. Music is really hard. It's, it's really hard. <laughs> It is. It is. <laughs> Even when it's easy, it's still hard. <laughs> so if it's not going well, don't forget, it's really hard. You don't suck. I mean, you might suck, but it's as likely. <laughs> well, we're not saying one or the other. Like, I don't know what you do. I mean, I don't know you. Maybe it's great. You. Maybe it's, maybe, yeah. yeah. Maybe it needs to But anyway, improve. consider you might suck. It's possible. Yeah. But also consider, be honest with yourself. Maybe you suck. Yeah. It's okay to do something else. We're all but works in progress. Also be honest that it's just music is really fucking hard and keep trying. Don't beat yourself up about it if the answer is not there immediately. You are not alone. <laughs> uh, women as lovers. How about that one? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. That was um, that was the first record we did that had no, I think this one song with drum machine, but it's all live drums with chess playing drums. on it. Yeah. Um, that's got that killer, uh, the Queen David Bowie song with, uh, Michael oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, John Dietrich from Deerhoof, uh, and uh, played guitar on that because that way out of my maybe I could do it now, but at the time, no way could I have played the guitar part, yeah. Um, he did a he did a great job, and then, um, I had I had become kind of loose acquaintances with Michael Jira and, um, we have a mutual friend named Fabrizio Palumbo from the band Larson. Um, and he had kind of as a joke said, uh, you got to get Michael, you guys, you and Michael have to do a cover of Under Pressure. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, whatever. You know, like, yeah, that's, that's okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> and then I kept thinking about it. I was like, he, like, he could just say no. I mean, I'll ask him. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, emailed him and he just said yeah you know but i knew that he is a massive david bowie fan right and i am a massive david bowie fan and then also a massive freddie mercury fan the first sushi shirt had a picture of freddie mercury on it i was about to mention that because i oh. remember, <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing, you remember. <laughs> i remember um, lots of weird stuff jamie it's fine <laughs> i'm i'm impressed um uh so you know I, I thought maybe that could you know sort of lure him in yeah um so I mean, for me, it was an interesting, it was an interesting thing because there was, uh, you know, like Michael, like, you know, from the time I was a young teenager, Swans were one of my favorite bands. Yeah. And then from the time I was a young teenager, like David Bowie was the first concert I ever went to. I totally loved the F Queen's Greatest Hits was the first cassette my dad bought it for me when I was like eight years old. I so, had that you know, tape. All of, all of that. <laughs> and so I, I do mean tape. It was together. a cassette. It yes. was a tape. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, all, all of these, all of these things, you know, coming, coming together. Yeah. Um, and by some sort of weird miracle, I said, yeah, I never do this kind of thing, but I like the song, so I'll do it. Um, and, uh, I, I mean, I was in Oakland, he was in New York. So I think he just, he like sent me his vocals on it, like mailed me a, his vocals on a CDR or something. It was before you could send files right, like right. over the internet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think of Mike yeah. Watt and Kira Rossler do, when they did Dose and they were like sending literal cassettes back and forth for the full oh, track. Cool. And I'm like, <laughs> in the mail, I'm like, what if they had lost it? Is the oh, first thing yeah. I think of, which says something about I my used personality. To, I used to go see them uh, when, I was, when I was a kid. That was always really, well, like a little kid, like 12 or something, I would go see them. Um, uh, yeah. And I, I just, uh, I 
Greg, Greg and I worked on putting it together. Carol Lee sang on it too. And I think she played Glockenspiel on it. Gl- yeah, Glock. I call it Glock. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's like one to, to, okay so Jamie for me that is one of the best duets of all time I don't care if it is not in the standard nomenclature of duets it's one of the best duets of all time like the, in, the David Bowie Freddie yeah, Mercury yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fucking it's, unbelievable it's astounding it's uh, uh, un, two of the two of the most particular but technically fantastic singers ever doing uh, doing a song together, like I, I cannot think of two cooler people to do a, to do a duet. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and I mean, you, it, it's gonna sound like you guys. It's good. It's gonna sound like you because it's you. Uh, but you, I mean, you're not trying to do like, like it's the kind of thing that I would hate to see a bar band cover that. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, it's it's it's, it's, it's a really it's a really <laughs> peculiar song. Like it's not like you'd have it ha it, it requires some delicacy. Yeah, because it would be um, it would be uh, robbed of the magic of it, which is part of it's just like these these two incredible singers in their own way, and two incredible artists singing. One a, a band at the peak of their power uh, th- that yeah. are playing, and it's all coming together in this way that it's, it kind of snakes and weaves as a composition, in, in and out of each other. Like there's so many things about it. I'm like, this could have gone wrong at any moment. This it's just perfectly executed. It, it's it's uh, in that Queen style of just rising, 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 rising. <laughs> and it's yeah, like, yeah. man, like that's just that it's yeah. That that's that song is a masterpiece. Yeah. Um. So some would say it would be uncoverable. I like that cover a lot, though. I think that cover is really good because it's not. Oh, thanks. It's not trying to do those same things. And then how would you know? You're not. You two are not those people. So of course, no. it's not. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's going to come out different. But yeah. I just remember thinking, like, I was like, wow, what a cool, bold choice of a cover. That makes sense. Like, especially it's like, oh, it's it's with. The guy from Swans? All right, rad. Because, like, that's kind of like, because y'all are, like, of the, like, dark, <laughs> freaky, goth industrial kid in the corner. You're the, you're the that of those to them, those people. And I was like, that's kind of cool. I like that. And um, anyway, thank you. I like the song. Uh, there's other songs on there, too. <laughs> Yeah, we they like uh let's see so chess uh chess wrote a lot of the vocal melodies on that oh really um yeah i think he wrote a lot of them on vibraphone and then i would uh um, nice. and then w- i would write lyrics to to the melodies uh it was it was it was it was interesting because uh i mean he's he's a he's a drummer but he's also a composer so he has an excellent yeah. melodic and harmonic sense uh and it was it was uh i think that that record sounds really different than a lot of our other records for that reason uh i mean you know i think he probably wrote the vocal melodies for probably half of the songs um so he i mean obviously he approached them differently than i would because he's a different person um so i i i always really appreciated that about that record that it had um uh just you know an an incredibly intimate and formative part of the definition of what makes a song a song came from uh another person i think it sort of you know made the for lack of a better description made the heart of what that record is uh, broader because of that no i, I hear that and, and that's uh, i mean it is kind of um i mean it isn't to say that the other stuff's inaccessible but there was an accessibility to that record i think that it came across a little differently right like, like we were, i mean we were really into i mean not that we were trying to sound like a top 40 band but we're listening to a lot of top 40 at the time, like sure. pop music yeah. then was not like we were trying to get over and be a pop band, but pop music at the, at kind of around air force and that record and the next, and the record after that. So from like maybe 2000, 2006 to maybe 2012 pop music was really interesting to us. Um, and was, you know, so it, it, it makes, it makes sense. I mean, not that we were again, trying to get over but that's just a lot of what we listen to as music fans yeah and and one's interesting that kind of being in the in the booyah bass (laughs) 
if oh, you yeah, will. Yeah. You know, like yeah. it, 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 like it, that makes sense. That that absolutely makes sense. I, it's uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. It, it, it's something that, like, like I said, like it, it's. I almost feel like it. If it came out a, a little later, it would have even got more attention, or maybe a little earlier. I don't know, but like, I, I feel like it's a that's a solid entry, solid, solid entry, solid record. I don't know. I'm not a time traveler. I can't really say, but. <laughs> uh, oh, I don't. I. I um, I wanted to also mention when when was the Salmonio record? That that was um two thousand third two thousand thirteen. Let's keep going with the juicy stuff. I, I want to talk about that though because I, I I've had Eugene on a couple times and I always freaking oh, forget cool. to, to to talk to him about that. I like that record. Uh, but before we do that, uh, dear God, I hate myself. How about that one? Uh, that came out in two thousand ten. Uh, I think I did most of it on a Game Boy. Yeah, that chip tune um, stuff, right? That Yeah, yeah. I didn't really know this is going to sound stupid, but I didn't really know what chip tunes was. I just had like the the uh, there was the, on the Nintendo DS uh Game Boy. There was like Korg uh the synthesizer company made a synthesizer for that, which is actually really usable. Oh, um, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I remember that now. Yeah, actually, that's that's right. Yeah, I I, yeah, I actually I still use it pretty regularly. Um uh so yeah so i mean i think it, it wasn't so much i think just because i just didn't know what it was it wasn't like we were trying to sound like that but that shit has a very particular tonality yeah um so it was and and i think more interested in pop music than at any other time uh so we're like we're like we're trying to make a weird pop record using largely using a game boy which is kind of what that record sounds like <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, there's, there's like not, a, a, not entirely, but but largely. I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, yeah. Maybe like half of it. Now that I think about it, I haven't listened to that record in a long time. There's some, there's some kind of grim, really grim ballads on that one. Too. Yeah, and there's there's stuff that's more. Um... I mean, it's not a jolly record. By no, means, no. But just you know, but you know, there's a lot of a lot of four in the floor. Yeah, kind of Tom Petty Jeez. style, I would call it. You know, like 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 kind of. Oh, I'd uh, love Tom Petty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, so and, and I was listening to a lot of Tom Petty at the time. Just like had the like the directness of his songwriting, and the the song structure. I I, I mean, I still like Tom Petty, but at the time, it was very influential. Yeah, I mean, there, there's such a. You, you know, it's it's just like it's his stuff's like it's just the whole meal. You know, it's, it's and it, and it's not trying to like get above its station on what it is. It's just good songwriting. It, it's there's something to be yeah, said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of amazing how many good songs he wrote. It really it's, is. <laughs> I yeah, was thinking it's about sort of, this recently. like anytime you hear one, you're like, "Fuck, that's great," and then you hear thirty more, and you're like, "Yeah, God, God all this, of song's those are this song's great. Yeah. <laughs> this song's great. This song's great." Yeah. Uh, that was another uh, Greg. Uh, Greg, uh, he at least uh, mixed that one, right? Uh, no, he produced it too. Okay, um, all right. Yeah, yeah. He, I lived in Durham, North Carolina then, and he lives in New York. And he, I think he came out a couple times. Chess came out to play on that one too. Nice. Uh, and John Dietrich played on it also. And then uh, Angela. I think it was the first record Angela played on. Oh, cool! Awesome. And uh, I think that was the last record Carolee. I think she played keyboard on the song on it, but it's the last thing she worked on. Uh, yeah, interesting vibe on that. Like almost kind of um, like OMD. <laughs> almost, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know I'll, what I mean. <laughs> I'll take, I'll say, I'll claim OMD any day of the week forever. The, those first yeah. four records are yeah, among my favorite records of all time since I was a kid and to this day. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'm glad I'm not <laughs> being insulting no, no, by man. saying that. You know. <laughs> but... Not in any way. OMD are wonderful. No, I mean, there's a, and like, and it was interesting because that was like what 2010. Like, there wasn't a lot of you weren't hearing a lot of that around that time. So it was kind of like, like I almost think of um, <laughs> the, the the less uh, frenetic Pet Shop Boys stuff too. You know, like the more the more oh yeah 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 and kind of. Yeah, Not yeah, that it yeah. sounds like that, but just vibe wise, I'm just like, oh no, that would fit. Yeah, on like what, like West End Girls is one of my favorite songs. Yeah, it's a good one. You could, yeah. you could again, you could do worse. <laughs> Actually, it's funny that you should say that because they had a record that came out at that time called Yes, and Pet Shop uh, Boys. the Pet Shop Boys did. That might be the wrong title, but at that time, and they did a album commentary, which I had never seen anybody do. Um, oh, like, like for a like movie. A, 
Yeah, yeah. They just they played the record and then they did a commentary. Oh, uh, that's cool. Record. I like that. Um, and then since then, uh, we have done drunk commentaries of our records. And Dear God, I Hate Myself was the first drunk commentary that we did and because the Pet Shop Boys had done it. And actually, I did it right after that record came out and was really embarrassed about what I was like because I just did it and then listened yeah. to it a couple of days later to, to you know, to put it together. It was like, this is Sears and Moron. <laughs> and then, um, and then I, I think in 2000, I can't remember, maybe 2017, 2018, I put it on Bandcamp. And then, uh, oh, I think I remember to, that now. Yeah, people seem to be into it. And like, since since then, we've done we've done almost all of them, or I have occasionally Angela will do it too. But we there's there's a we're, we're almost caught up, we just have one more to do. But they are it's I don't like doing them at all because I have to get really, really, really drunk. Yeah, so the next day, I just feel like, you're like, What did I say? Well, also, just like I'm unbelievably hungover. <laughs> um, so like in order to get drunk enough to do it right 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 and there, there's been there have been some that i have not been drunk enough to actually do it and i'll listen back and like they tend to be less interesting because it's more self-aware <laughs> or it's just not yeah like... yeah yeah okay. yeah you know i mean i'm not just like saying a bunch of stuff that i definitely should not say <laughs> which is what people tune in for right so yeah 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 and I, i've gotten somewhere now now when i edit them i'll edit them I won't edit them sober. I'll edit them when I'm still drunk just to keep, cause just to try and let them be as cut down as to the possible. litigation. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, 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 no. To have, to have to, to be less aware of and not to overthink it so much to sort of let some potentially inflammatory and very stupid things sort of stay in there. Whereas if I was sober, I'd be like, I can't fucking add half of this. I sound like an idiot. And right someone could sue me for libel for this like right, we're not right. liable for defamation so um so they're anyway if there's you want to have things... it be like a peek behind the curtain and if you're having like it be well, super I mean, I edited it to be then... a real thing you know? yeah yeah I mean, yeah they're uh i would imagine they're more interesting to listen to if, if they're really like all hogs fully loose yeah yeah rather oh, than sure. sort of poured over and, and and extra cautious um but yeah, so if you listen to one and it's a little bit boring, I was just not drunk enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, it's it's interesting too because I was thinking the other day about how commentary tracks on movies used to be such a thing, and now in the era of streaming, like they've they've. Uh, it's, oh like, yeah, I hadn't I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, yeah, I and, and like know. the one I always bring up is Spinal Tap, because. All those those fellas did a commentary of Spinal Tap in character. Oh, really? <laughs> and it's basically like a whole nother movie, like because because really they're just riffing on it, and they're and they're again they're doing it, and it was like God, that's such a great usage of that form. It's awesome. That's hilarious. I gotta see that. But I, I think I, I'd like to see commentaries make more of a make more of a comeback, because especially when it's something where. And I suppose there's something to be said for just keeping things mysterious, sure. But like when when it's like, oh no, if you can have context added in, like I glom on, I glom on to anything that certain directors will do. I'm like, wow, I want to know more about that. And sometimes yeah, you yeah, want to yeah. know more, and like it's fine to want to know more. Maybe you shouldn't. And sometimes it's like, no, I know more now. I'm even more into it now. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's that that could that could go real hard in either direction. Correct. Yes, and and I think that it's it's interesting that. Like the the idea of co the commentaries on the record is fascinating because I feel like as things have gone to streaming and it's like okay like even the artwork right it's like oh it's this little postage stamp size thing on your phone that you that like you <laughs> I think I can see what that is you know whereas think about how important artwork was like I would buy a record I'm like that looks cool I bet that sounds good and then like oh wow it's my that's this is the, that that's was the band television they're fantastic i love this you know like that looks cool what is that okay well that's a band called sonic youth they they going to change the way you think about guitars and like now everybody has instant access to everything so that's less of a thing which also means you can like not waste money which sometimes i did uh but i find that i, I would like to have that be more 
Well, I mean, it's, I mean, that is how it is, but it's, it's a choice. I mean, like, I don't listen to any music on any streaming platform because I just think it's a, it's a shitty way to, I mean, I'm also fucking pedantic and uptight, so um, it's also, <laughs> but I mean, it's just, to me, it's not a satisfying way to listen to music. Yeah, I mean, yeah. having it, having there be no effort behind it and having it be essentially totally disposable for me makes it harder to really connect to it. And then also, like you said, like, I like album art, so um, to to me, it's yeah. worth the time and effort. And also, like, I mean, but it's it it works for my music habits. Like, I even before streaming, I probably would buy like seven or eight records a year. I never I never had bought like a hundred records a year. So I mean, it's relatively easy. <laughs> like, I'm not gonna go broke because <laughs> I don't buy a lot of records anyway. Sure, sure, but I, mean, I still um, remember like, but it's it, to me, it's much more. I'm kind of what you're saying. Like, it's more satisfying to have it require some amount of connection because you spent money on it and you took the time to get it. And it's this thing that right. you can't just throw in the garbage. You could conceivably throw it out your cart window. Um, so, I mean, so you have to, you have to give it more time. You have to. Can I tell you when I first heard the Pixies didn't like it. I'm like, Ugh, yeah. this sucks. And then I was like, well, but I spent money on it. <laughs> I might as well listen to it. I'm like, Oh wait, this is genius. What was my problem? The same but for it's... me with 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 PJ Harvey, who's now yeah. one of my all time favorites. I was like, "What the? This is whatever. Uh, I don't yeah. care about this." And then I I was like, "Okay, well, I only have five records, so then again, <laughs> you know." And then I was like, and then I just like I don't know. I think to bring you my love, I I probably listened to it and no other record maybe a hundred times in a row. What an incredible that... record! But at, at first, I was like, "This doesn't sound." Like the other two records at all? What is yeah. this shit? No, I was so obsessed with Rid of Me. I'm like, I'm like, hell yeah, new PJRV record. Let's go. Can't. And then I was like, oh yeah. But then, like after after like, <laughs> but that was again. You know, now I have seven records. So, but it's like, as, as soon as it as soon as it clicked, like I really listened to it again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Which I wouldn't have done had I listened to it for thirty seconds and had it for free and was like, this is crap. Right. And so, anyway, I. But I like the, I, I like that dynamic, so I I choose to keep the luddite approach. And, and the last thing I'll mention is, I mean, I used to remember like you know opening the Nirvana record. Oh, what are the bands that they think in there? Cool, I'll go buy a Mud Honey record. I'll go buy a Butthole Surfers record. I'll go, you know, like like and that yeah, yeah. avenue of discovery, which now anybody can. It, it's not. <sighs> there's more of it, but it seems to matter less. So, what I'm getting around to is, I like the idea of like the commentary track on like by the artist on the record is like that's interesting, that's cool, and and like, I don't know, maybe maybe they maybe that should be something more bands do. Some of them, not all, and of them. and drunk or high. <laughs> I was gonna say that was without the aspect of it being like under the influence. <laughs> I did actually. I did the Air Force on mushrooms and. Holy marijuana holy. and LSD. Um, that was, yeah, that was a weird one. <laughs> it was hard. It was hard to do. That's, that <laughs> can I tell you, Jamie, that sounds like an actual nightmare to, to, to experience. That sounds like that would be, I mean, luckily the record's probably 35 minutes long. So <laughs> it wasn't like, it wasn't like I had to do it. I feel like I did every record we ever did. In right, one day, right. And that's sure, you know, sure, sure, sure. Once to it was done, ones. I would, you know, and did not edit that one that day. I came back and did it later. <laughs> yeah, man. That's a. Uh... Wow. Yeah. Uh... Okay. So, so how about always? How about always? That's a. Uh... Uh, yeah, that was. I kind of. I feel sort of silly saying this. Um, I kind of. Feel like knife play to always was like a particular chapter a particular way of approaching making records right um that after that changed um which was essentially we will write 10 songs this year and that's the record and um and now we kind of have a an idea of what the record is going to be and then make the record whereas before it was just these are the songs that make up the record um uh i had a I was living in Durham, North Carolina at the time, which I did not like. It was not a good fit for me. And I had no friends and a lot of time on my hands. So um, uh, it was very, that was the first record that John Congleton mixed. And 
I think I think the track count on that record was rather excessive because I had so much time to work on it <laughs> that he yeah. <laughs> when when I brought it to his studio that's the like he said did you have a lot of time when you were working on this and I didn't think about it because like oh yeah this has 60 tracks on it that's I probably didn't need quite that many but you know so it was uh, like very very uh greg worked on that one too like very considered very poured over super detailed yeah um probably the last w record we made that was like pointedly uh, exploring pop very specifically i mean there's a sure, couple yeah. kind of doomy ballads on it but um like very very much interested in and in that and then like how to make art art pop essentially uh, or you know, or what 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 it what it could possibly mean, you know. But then there's like a like an industrial song called "I Love Abortion" on it, and a, <laughs> a song right. of, <laughs> uh, you know. So L U V, not, not by the that. way, for the audio <laughs> listeners, L U V. I love, which, that's the part that got me. I was, I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> that rocks. Uh, um, so, I mean, so it's not and not entirely just that, but it was you know, lar largely uh, largely about that. Carla. Oh yeah, Carla Bosley. Was, was, yeah, it was on there. I, I love her. Yeah, she's awesome. duet. Yeah, incredible singer. Yeah. Yeah, she's. She's rad. We had, we I've been a, a fan of her since uh, Ethel Meeplow. I mean, that's how yeah, back, yeah. back at, long back ago with her. Yeah, she, she is. She's she's one of she's one of the greats. Um, I think. She, I got a kind of a, like a sexy text from her last week, but I think it was on accident. I think she meant to send it to somebody else. I I know she didn't mean to send it to me. That and rocks. I, like, Hi, I love that. Hi, Carly. This is Jamie. Did you mean this for somebody else? And she went. She just wrote, "Why should it be for you?" <laughs> Which was pretty great. <laughs> Seriously, Carla, man, that's that's so. Yeah. So anyway, I think I, 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 I can't remember what I wrote back. I, but, I was trying. I was. I've been trying to talk her to come into the show for a couple of years now, and I, I kind of. Oh yeah, she she would be amazing. I should totally have her on. I, I you definitely should. You definitely I, should. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a note because there's people that like. Look, here's a here here's here's an open secret about this show. I've been doing it almost ten years. I do it completely on my own. So I'll just forget about stuff sometimes, and I'm like, oh yeah, oh. <laughs> I should she, have so and so on. <laughs> she is she is a legend, and she's and so a, and an excellent an excellent storyteller. She'll have. It, it will it will be a fascinating episode. You should yeah. definitely have her on. I, I so and then yeah. I, now I can bring up uh, when you accidentally sexted <laughs> sex texted. Jamie's I could be wrong. <laughs> like either way, like if I'm wrong or if I'm right, like I maybe, probably shouldn't have said this. But... Maybe she's just owning it though. Maybe she's like, I don't know. Like why not? <laughs> maybe tell her that I think she's a wonderful artist and a I massive will. influence on me and has played many of the best shows I've ever seen ever. Instead of something potentially not accurate and embarrassing, <laughs> if you would be so kind. Okay. All right, all right, fine. I'll, I'll do you the solid on that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think there's. Uh, so what are, we're talking. We're talking about always here. Yeah. So lots of tracks. Very, very, very lush in that way. Um, there's a. Oh, Angela wrote a song and sang on it uh, on that on that record. Oh really? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. She wrote a song called "Honeysuckle," and it's a, it's a duet. Um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. It's a, like a very sweet kind of broken heart little banger. I remember. Um, yeah. It's yeah. yeah. It's it's a it's a good song. Uh, she did a nice job. On. I wish she would write more songs. Yeah, that's a good one. That's good. It's solid. Um, there's the the per the, the 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 person who commits suicide that that was on there. I can't remember the. Um, um, what is it? Chimneys of fire? Is that right? Oh, an attempt did not commit suicide. 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 Okay, sorry. I, it's been. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, but that's uh, yeah, that's kind of heavy. That's a. Uh... Oh yes, I uh, I didn't that I didn't write that one. Sam Sam Mickens uh, wrote that song. I mean, it's not like that. That's that sort of thing is not. It's not super far afield in the Jushu universe. Don't get me wrong, but uh, I, I, I remember that one being like, "Oh, oh, okay," kind of situation. Like um, in the way that do you listen to Nina Nasaja at all? I know that name, but I, I don't oh, know. God, that. She's fucking incredible. She's so oh, good. cool. 
Uh, she she's done a lot of amazing records, and she was just on the show, so it's it's it's, it's on oh, on cool. my mind. I'll check but it out. she she's in the, so many amazing records, but she did this record called Riderless Horse that came out um, last year, and it's so. It's so good, but it's so right there that like it's again, it's not an everyday listener in that way. You know what I mean? And so mm-hmm. that's that's kind of um which is interesting because I think this is that's kind of a hooky I think always is kind of a hooky record. <laughs> but like Oh yeah, there's yeah, I mean it's it's like we were trying to you know, I mean not like trying to write a hit record, but we were interested in hooks. Yeah. Then, but, so yeah. But that goes back to the Iggy Pop song on the cruise liner commercial of like, Are you listening to this? Like, you know, like I mean know, that I mean that's you know, I mean that was still when, you know, we could unembarrassingly hang our hat on the smiths you know i mean all the sure. songs are very catchy but very very largely very sad when they're not being right. hilarious right right like little poignant bittersweet little moments and, and, and things along those lines yeah uh yeah i love abortion i forgot about that one <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's that's great. Not such a hooky jam. No, not at all. But a great song. <laughs> uh, uh, anything else for that one before, before we move on? I don't think so. Okay, because I mean, we do. We do. I think when that when that record first came out, we played probably eight or nine songs from the record on the tour. But yeah. I think now we only play two. But I love abortion is one of the ones we still play live. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's timely, right? It's still astonishingly some fucking how. <laughs> it shouldn't be, but it it's uh yeah, timely. Uh I love the Nina Simone tribute album. Oh, N- thanks. Nina. A lot of people say it's our worst record, but I appreciate it. Really? That. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people hate it. It's br- was brutally reviewed. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Like, uh, like, 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 kind of one of those things where, uh, like, Pitchfork gave it a particularly unkind and, to my estimation, unfair review, and then everybody yeah. was just like, "Oh, now we just have to like copy and paste this review." So, like, what? Yeah, oh, it was, it was like, right. one of the, like un, un, unfair, sort of lazy. I mean, not to. I mean, complaining about music journalism is childish. And no, but totally that's pointless. a thing that happens. But, but the, it does. It. I mean, with that one, it was like really intensely badly reviewed i don't really think, i mean oh it was gnarly it was Man. crazy okay she was like she, like she, like she, <laughs> like i never read reviews ever yeah yeah it was badly reviewed enough that even i know it was really savage <laughs> right right yeah yeah so like it to like an excessive like it almost became like a meme to, to savage that well, record. and sometimes it's yeah would you like the first thing somebody says that's what everyone else says so, like i'm thinking about um the most recent todd haynes movie which i i love todd haynes and uh may december great loved it awesome but i guess it, one reviewer called it campy early on it's not by the way but mm-hmm. like everyone's like well it's so campy and blah blah, blah. i'm like can't why is everyone saying this is campy what and there's like oh one person said it yeah okay yeah, that's why all right lazy that's why yeah uh yeah, May December's great, by the way. That's a great movie. I'll check it out. I have uh, very mixed feelings about Todd Haynes, but I when I, when he's been great, he's been particularly great. I agree. Like I and I I think he's a great artist that there's swings and hits and swings and misses. I'm glad you use <laughs> I'm glad you use that word because I always appreciate a big swing. Yeah, oh, for sure. Sometimes you connect and sometimes you don't, but he has he has he always takes a big swing, which yes. even yes. if it's not to my taste, I always really respect that. Agreed. I, I, I quite enjoyed it, and uh, I did not find it campy at all, but I, I found it darkly humorous, which I'm like, that is not camp to me, but okay. You know, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. The whole idea of, re- I don't want to talk about this beyond this one statement. I right. think reviews are like the dumbest thing in the entire world. Just listen to it yourself. <laughs> I like, think I think people do that now. I think that is an actual sea change in culture is that... Um, Thank God. Yeah, and maybe for the better, right? <laughs> Definitely for the better. <laughs> now, the other well, side of that. talk about, like, the holiness of, like, excellent cultural reviewing. But it's bullshit. Yeah. It's, it's like, fuck so, that asshole. Sometimes like, that happens. Like, go listen to your, like, they're, they're, they are inherently lazy and are yeah. playing into inherent laziness. Don't, don't 
increase that snowball. Just go listen to it yourself if it seems remotely <laughs> interesting to you. And now let's not talk about it anymore because it's the most boring thing. In the sure, 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 sure. Well, I, I, I think Nina's cool, man. I think that I think that's a cool record. And, and I'm I, shaking my fist at you, <laughs> at all of you, uh, reviewers of the world. Well, it's a reimagination. It's not like a you know. It, it's it's like so. I guess it depends on what you think of Nina Simone, right? If you think of Nina Simone as like in this certain box of of what some people think of Nina Simone, cool. But I, I like that you approach it as like, no, she's like a was like a bold artist, and this is like taking these songs and kind of I don't know, like 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 bringing other things out of them. I mean, I don't. I have to take a deep breath because now I've, I've been very. I know we're all worked up about I'm these very, reviews. I'm very very whiny. <laughs> um. <laughs> I, uh, I mean, you know, like with every record we've ever done, I, I gave it everything I had at the time and yeah. I, uh, I, I hope somebody got something out of it. You know, um, it was like some of the, it was one of the, one of the, the most interesting musical experiences of my life to work on that it's record. It's gotta be, right? I mean, that, that's like, cause that, there's so many ways that you could have approached it and there's so many there's so much there I, again i thought it was unique i thought it was i thought it was cool i, I think that mary's on that one right uh Hal, yeah Hal, yeah mary halverson a bunch of like, everybody who played awesome. on this is, is an incredible badass yeah. i don't know I'm, I'm surprised here that some people didn't like it that's that's shocking to me but whatever screw it's up okay i mean yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's in summation screw up it hurt my feelings and i was embarrassed so fuck you <laughs> I, I, well, I, yeah, I dig it. So whatever. But you're never you're never going to build you. a career based on what I like. But it's fine. You, you, it's it's it's. Nor uh... what I like. So. <laughs> uh, I got to remember to send you right to the source. By the way, you're, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna. I think you'll dig it, or maybe you'll hate it. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, I'll check it out. What was I? Oh, um. Oh, Chess. Uh, just it should be noted. Chess Smith did all the arrangements on that record. Nice. Yeah. Who? Yeah. He's really great with that. I mean, he, I think he gets credit for being an awesome drummer, which he is. He is. He's also a spectacular composer. Great arranger, great composer. Producer, composer. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think, I don't think he gets enough credit for that. Cause it's, yeah. I don't know, maybe it's cause he's it's understandable. Awesome. I mean, his drumming is so particular and incredibly powerful. So it's, it's understandable, but he's, uh, he's very, very well-rounded. Do you ever see theory of ruin? Oh yeah, for sure. I love yeah. that band with, uh, yeah, they're great. Alex, uh, Alex Newport. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, Dave, they, they were, Gone, yeah, lost to history, but they were a great band. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I, was, I talk about them, and people are like, who? I'm like, okay, which that happens sometimes, you know, whatever. Um, uh, Angel Guts, right across. Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, so kind of like what I said with always was sort of like the end of a particular chapter. This was the kind of beginning of our kind of approaching records in a way that we still do, insofar as. Yeah, they'll have very particular parameters. Uh, what those parameters and how those parameters are defined can change. But um, it was uh, so. The aforementioned John Congleton mixed always, and he said we were just chatting, um, and he said, "Oh, you know, for your next record, you should do a record that sounds like Suicide." And it had never occurred to me to like go into making a record with the approach predetermined. Um, Interesting. So thought, okay, okay. So we will. So for this record, um, so we, okay, it will be influenced by Suicide, Nico, Kraftwerk, and uh, Neubauten, and we will only use uh, analog drum machines and analog synthesizers and a little bit of percussion, and that's that's what. And so with those parameters, then we'll make this record. Um, and it was the first time we had done that, and kind of since for every record, we always kind of have a little plan for what it will be um but at, at the time i had moved i grew up in los angeles but i just moved back to los angeles and um uh kind of the only place i could af afford to live was this very very intense neighborhood called macarthur park and i had never you know oh, i mean right, when i lived in yeah. i mean i grew up in this i'm like a like a super normal middle class kid and like grew up in the valley you know, in the Valley, it's a lot of problems and can be really weird. But like MacArthur Park is particularly intense place, and I had I had never uh, I had never lived in in a, in a place like that. Um, 
in some ways incredibly inspiring and beautiful in its kind of relentless yeah. <laughs> human horror. Yeah, like um, every, every like five feet, right? You know. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like it's, oh, here's it's, a new it's the most strategy. it's the most densely populated or uh, or peopled part of Los Angeles. Uh, I mean, it's 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 you know, Los Angeles is very spread out, but it's it's you know, it's more like a, a, a little bit like not as dense as New York, but a little bit like being someplace like that. Um, just incredible drug problems, a lot of gang violence, um, a lot of uh, houselessness, a lot of poverty, but also mixed in all of that, uh, it's a sort of center for um, uh, the, the Santa Muerte worship. Uh, so that was not something that I was familiar with either. So, you know, there's a lot of Santa Muerte temples in that area also, and a lot of Santeria temples in that area. So it was, uh, I mean, as a, as, a, as a honky tourist, it was incredibly illuminating for me to get to see parts of- That's parts an of, album title right there, honky yeah. tourist, by the way. <laughs> you know, to sort of observe parts of, of what that was. Um, and, you know, and and then at the same time, be surrounded by a lot of uh, very negative human human yeah. living. Um, so that that record was a a, a lot of, of about uh, being in that and that kind of in, being in that environment. Well, there's like so, almost kind of like a low grade fear of physical harm. <laughs> no, there was not. It wasn't a low grade fear. <laughs> or mid grade, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There were there were several close brushes with. Uh, with, um dread getting murdered yeah 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 <laughs> it yeah, was not it was yeah. i mean i think it's it's probably for better or worse and this was 10 years ago so it's hopefully things have cooled out and it's not as and when i was there it was bad but it was much worse at other times but that at other times in la history it was like a really tony and like nice neighborhood so it got real rough during pandemic uh peak pandemic, oh i would I imagine know. like it was yeah. not not great that doesn't <laughs> but, surprise me at all yeah yeah um, so yeah, so that was uh, that was a that record was a big turning point for us. Thor uh, is on that record. Also Thor on my B list forever. Not talking about him either. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, I love John Conklin. He, that guy is. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that, been, that, it's been, it's been, it's been. Here's how long that, it's been since he's been on the show. He hadn't won a Grammy yet. I said I was oh, going wow. that I was going to kneecap Jack White, oh. <laughs> which I thought was very clever. And so, like, that's how long it's been since he has been. Well, on the that's show. been a, it's been so a it's bit. Been a he long actually time. he he just mixed our most recent record, actually. Um, He's... Yeah, which well, I mean, I, I'm only bringing it up because we got the mixes like two days ago. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, he's he's wonderful. So I I I worked on that one a lot at my little home studio in L.A. and then went to that was when he was he wasn't in L.A. at that point. He was still in Dallas. Yeah, and then uh, flew out to Dallas and did a bunch of recording there. Did all the vocals there with him, and did a bunch, like a bunch of other synth parts too, and some overdubs. But I think that's a uh, yeah, and th th there's a lot, there's a lot of nuance to that record, but it's it's definitely you know, parts parts of it could be considered a harsh joke, I suppose. But uh, you know, like so oh yeah, I mean I don't think it's a nuanced record. I think it's pretty poundy, <laughs> pretty pretty direct. <laughs> There, which is to say, I'm talking about more like the robustness of it, just like like the, there's layers. Uh, there's good layers to it. There's good layers to it. Let's put it that way. Um, what, why is there? I think it might be. Uh, I think it's Angela's favorite Shushu record. Is that one? Yeah, it's kind of like a. I think it's a grower for sure. I think it's one that like presents as one thing and then has um, depths to it that you have to kind of like stick with to unveil or uncover um but you know hey this is about you know area living in there was like regularly dragged for bodies so of course there is there's gonna be depths to all of it yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. not untrue hey oh i think the, the one year that true. i live there i think they pulled four bodies out of that lake <sighs> woof yeah woof um okay so <laughs> Yeah, where do you go from there, right? Uh, Unclouded Sky. Oh, man, you're hitting them all. Um, yeah, let's talk about that one. That's an interesting one. Uh, 
that is a record of religious covers of religious folk songs. And then I wrote one from, from like the American religious folk songs and one and, and Caribbean religious folk songs. Yeah. Uh, Wild and wrote, idea. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I wrote one song kind of in the style of that that's on that record, but the rest are covers. Um, what what gave you the idea for that? Like, what, that's it was such a kind of left field thing for me. Uh, I mean, my dad was a folk musician, and I'm kind of like privately religious. So, like, liturgical music is interesting to me. Um, and uh, I mean, American folk songs are just you know, kind of part of music that I listened to growing up. Um, I mean, and a lot of them, you know, I mean, the like, it's, I don't have like an easy, like a free and easy time being privately religious. Like it's a fairly fraught situation for me. Sure. And those, I mean, those songs are largely about, um, you know, doubt and pain and hopelessness and worry. And, uh, um, I mean, you know, I mean, they were written by people who, you know, lived through the depression or were incredibly, uh, in, you know, impoverished or, you know, were suffering under the colonialism or, you know, or, you know, lived in a log cabin and, you know, died when they were 40. I mean, it, all these songs were, you know, written by people uh, you know, like barely hanging on and yeah. trying to turn to spirituality to find some kind of answer. And they're all very... they're all so like like blatant like there's no subtlety or artifice and or posing in any of them um i mean i mean they're i mean i i mean they they're they're kind of i mean i mean despite their like technical sim simplicity uh, i mean they're, they're kind of like the height of or, you know one of the heights of human aesthetic expression in so yeah. far as how yeah, yeah. totally pure purely they do exactly what they set out to do um and i i thought i had a, I, at the time i was touring i was touring with swans a lot um and one of the great things about touring with swans is they're fucking incredible every night but one of the difficulties of being an opening band for swans is their sound checks tend to go very very long because they're <laughs> they have they have a lot to do so dense yeah 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 so not infrequently uh um, there really wouldn't be any time for me to sound check. So I was trying to think of something that I could do that I could basically get away with a 30 second sound check, oh, which was, okay, okay, if I do yeah. guitar and vocals, like I can't really fuck that up. Right. That, they would have to really try hard to make that not work. <laughs> I've heard it by the way, but anyway, <laughs> it is difficult. You're right. You almost have to be trying. <laughs> um, so that was kind of the idea. And then I had played, uh, this, they had the Swans had put together this kind of mini festival show in London, and yeah. uh, Shazad Ismaili was playing with Ben Frost, and I was acquaintances with Shazad, and he was doing a bunch of producing at the time, which he still does. And he had said, "I hey, I like this site. If you want to come and record this, I'd like to produce it." And he was he lived in Iceland at the time, so he said, "Come to Iceland and record it." <laughs> awesome. So yeah, so we just like recorded at the Cigaros studio, which was funny con considering it was an unbelievably super nice studio. And we just did it with all like one mic, <laughs> like we could have done nice. it anywhere. Um, so, but it was particularly nice to, I mean, you know, the songs I've, I've a close personal connection to. Yeah, so yeah. It, was, it was nice to be able to go to the, an, an, a rarefied and beautiful and special place and, and, and approach them. And especially, you know, Shazad was very delicate and encouraging, did a great job making sure it, it uh, could be as, as good as it could be um but yeah that's a i mean i because i didn't write all you know i only wrote one song on it i mean yeah. i feel i mean i it's easier for me to sort of uh, i guess think about that record because it was you know because i have some distance from it yeah um and i i you know i I, I would never out loud say this about any other record, but I feel a great deal of affection towards that. Yeah, it's cool. No, that's why I wanted to bring it up because it's 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 um, I feel like it's 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 almost lost in the shuffle, but it's it's very uh, unadorned. Well, yeah, I mean, it just you know? uh, it, I mean, it was just like a record store day release. Yeah. Um, but actually, that's getting reissued next year too. There you go. So I think I think it was like like I think they only did like five hundred copies of it or some something really small like that. So which. Which of the collaborative records came first? The one with Marisbo or Salminio? Which one of those came first? Salminio. I... Was, okay. Was first. Right. Yeah. 
So love Eugene. Eugene's been on the show. Yeah, three one, of, one, of times? My, one of my idols. Actually, I'm reading his memoir as we Great. speak. Great. Yeah, when I had him on recently, it was like it's half the book. It's 10 feet away from me. <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, great book. Uh, we had ha- half on for the new record and half on for that last time. Oh, That's, cool. Right um, when that happened, I was like, oh, that's cool. Because, like, that's another that's another guy that's, like, Eugene is, like, uniquely himself, right? Like, he's, he's, oh, yeah. he's like, an original, right? And I would say it's you're so an original delicious. as well. So it's like, okay, what does that sound like? Well, it sounds like this. It sounds like Salminio. How did that all come to pass? Because I, 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 I briefly talked about it with him, but I don't remember it was on air, and I don't want to tell any tales out of school. So uh, I had been a big Oxbow fan, you know, being from the Bay Area. Yeah. Uh, and I had seen them a few times. And um, I was living in Seattle, and they were playing, and it was just him and Nico, and Nico playing acoustic guitar. It wasn't like oh right, yeah, because they were doing that for a while. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I remember that. And uh, it was one. It like blew my brains out. I, I mean, I had seen Oxbow a couple times before, but this was to- obviously a totally different thing. Um, and um, I just at the show i just asked eugene like how to get a contract with him and asked him if he wanted to sing on something um and then it, it took it was maybe like a i had moved to oakland because we were oh sorry i forgot to say this we had he sang on a song called juarez that that was just like on a single on a 45 that we did okay all right um and i just he wrote the lyrics too i just told him it, just to write a song right about the femicide in juarez and then he wrote the lyrics for it and then just like came to my apartment and, and, and sang. And then we got to be friends then. So we, we stayed in touch, um, you know, and I would go see Oxbow play and, um, and uh, I know I, I was getting really into uh, Morton Feldman, who I am still crazily into, but it was when I was really diving deep into him and, um, and also into just, more sort of formalized experimental music um but i also found a lot of like 75 minute long experimental pieces a little bit difficult to get through so i thought okay well, what if i did a record of experimental pieces and they were all like like 30 seconds to two minutes long right yeah um sure. and then i thought oh well eugene is one of my favorite singers of all i mean it took you know it was kind of apropos of nothing thought okay eugene is one of my favorite singers of all time it seems like this is something that he could make his own to lay into a little bit. Yeah. 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 And, uh, just asked him about it and, you know, and fortunately he was, he was down to do it. And, uh, I mean, we've, uh, yeah, we've, we've stayed, stayed friends since I saw him when they were in Berlin just a couple months ago. They were, they were great. Consistent. We did, yeah. We did, we did one, one tour together. Yeah. What, whatever. So many, so many did one tour. Yeah. So many did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Was there ever putting under a band name? Was that like a aesthetic choice? Uh, oh, to do it as, as Salmonio as a band? Yeah, uh, yeah, like, like uh, rather than being like Jamie Stewart and Eugene Robinson, or oh, uh, yeah, I mean, it just sort of kind of makes it more of its own its own thing. I mean, on the on the record, it very clearly s- stated it was us doing it. Right, right, right. You was know, it, so there was wasn't no, like no a mystery. secret or anything. Yeah, yeah, it was no, <laughs> no mystery about it. But yeah, I mean, it allows it to be its own its own uh you know it, iteration of its of itself it, it didn't have to it, it hopefully it got a little less it would give it there would be a little bit less baggage and people could come to it on its on its own terms i think was the idea also it's a cool band name too yeah you know, like why it's, let it's it go a super cool band name yeah U- absolutely yeah. <laughs> idea. uh how was it how it shows for that how... oh they were they were great i mean we didn't get a chance to rehearse at all i mean we yeah. just they were just in Europe. We just, the first show was the first time we played together. Um, <laughs> wow. Uh, but I, I love doing it. I mean, they were all kind of s- small shows, except for maybe we did like one festival show. Yeah. Um, but it was pretty kind of, it was sort of imp- improvised, I guess. Like I had kind of the arc of, that I was doing and then, then Eugene would sort of, it wasn't like we played a, a one minute song and then played another one minute song. We, we played like a, 45 minute long set or something as oh, one, like long one piece, piece. Yeah. yeah yeah sure. yeah but i mean yeah. they introduced elements that were in the songs and then eugene would sing 
the lyrics at kind of different times. So, um, but you know, he's an extraordinarily great singer. So, yeah, you know, for somebody who loves great singers and doesn't like to sing, I mean, the opportunity to be on stage <laughs> with one of my favorite singers of all time was perfect for me. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. As as adequately established earlier. <laughs> Uh, yeah, cool, uh, cool band, cool record. How did the thing with Marisville come about? Because you you collaborated years before that. I remembered. Uh, oh, we did. Like, we like didn't a live show we or just, something. Like, yeah, we just we just played a show together. Yeah, and that's... It, I mean, but it wasn't. We didn't play together. Like we just were on the same stage. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. like we opened for Marisville. Um which is crazy. It was it was it was a cool show. <laughs> I mean, like. I would imagine just like that's just kind of this going to be a nut scene, right? Like, like what do Marisbo was... fans look like? Like what 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 is what is the the makeup of that crowd? Like what you'd think, like you know, people like basically what we're wearing, like black hoodie, <laughs> t shirt. Yeah, yeah I mean, I guess I've been to harsh noise <laughs> shows. I get it. I just like it's just he's like like the Led Zeppelin of harsh noise, you know. Like it's, like, yeah. I don't know. It's at a proper analogy, probably not. It's just at a much bigger level, I think, than a lot of the the the, the tabletop noisemakers necessarily. Oh yeah, you know, I mean, he you know was has one of the people who invented it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. What what hast thou Roth, Marisbo? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but so how did that I, come across? So so that was like you it, you you played together some years back, and then yeah, it was a, yeah. Um, uh, a, a label guy named Tim Clapp. Um, I had produced a record for his band, and he just asked me if we wanted to do a collaboration record with Morrisbow, and he put it out. Um, and you know, I mean, I'm a bit of, I've been a, had been a fan for yeah. decades, so you know, so it was a, an easy yes. And Morrisbow's wife, I have don't met, I haven't met her or Masami's wife. Um, I haven't met her. But apparently she likes Shushu, so she told me to do it. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, but yeah, what Angela and I sent him some tracks, and he ran them through his Mersbau Iser, and then uh, and that was that. <laughs> and there you go. And, uh, and then he got a record. There it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's just, that. That was. I remember when that came. I was like, huh? Like I was like, that's an interesting idea of of because the idea of it. I mean, love and hate are indifferent. That's someone that created a genre pretty much oh oh you know definitely. yeah yeah i mean i guess you can say metal machine music but i mean okay like really like as far as in a modern content like like well i mean not many people can say created that. a genre i mean yes, metal machine yes. yeah, yeah i mean like pointedly tried to do something which right, is right. different than metal machine music absolutely yeah. agreed agreed um notably said which which god as artists isn't that what we all sort of strive for or a lot of us yeah anyway. uh look I'm a big Twin Peaks fan. I was pretty freaking pumped when he did the plays the music of Twin Peaks album. I was pretty psyched about that. Still am, frankly, uh, truth told. I just had Steve Hodges on the show who plays with Mike Watt and MSSV, with Mavis Staples, Bob Dylan, Tom Waits. But oh, cool. Pink Room. Like he, he did all that stuff with David Lynch and, and like he was good enough to listen to me. Oh, really? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Wow. That's cool. I and didn't know that. He was very cool about uh, talking about all that stuff. Oh, uh, nice! And um, you know, me nerding out about that and that um, that Fox Bat Strategy record that uh, that was like a tribute to Dave Jarecki, like all that that, that came out. With anyway, whatever. Point of fact, I love all that stuff. So when I heard you guys were re envisioning those that music and those tunes, I was like, hell yeah! I can't wait to hear what that's all about. Uh, so first of all pretty bold and ambitious move oh it, it it wasn't really our idea okay um lawrence english who uh if you're unfamiliar with his music you should check it out it's really spectacular he runs a room 40 label does music under his own name so curator and a record producer he's actually mastering our next record he mixed our last record nice wonderful nice. guy close friend of ours um and a collaborator and a colleague and a good friend uh, he lives in Brisbane, Australia, and David Lynch, the um, Jose Silva was the curator at the Gallery of Modern Art in Brisbane, and they were doing the first retrospective of David Lynch's visual art. Um, 
like pointedly his visual his his visual his his painting the, the paintings so, the the, yeah. the ants with the eating the meat and all that uh good stuff by the way if you're familiar yeah. his visual art is great um and uh i ran into lawrence on tour in the netherlands he was on tour we were on tour and he was talking about this thing and he said why don't you guys why don't you guys play the music of twin peaks and at the time i was like yeah fucking right um <laughs> And uh, <laughs> for the exhibit, like two, for this exhibit with the for visual the, arts, for the exhibit, okay. for the Got it. yeah, it's part cool, of the cool, exhibit cool, cool, cool. at the museum. And he just kind of stayed on it, and right. you know, I mean, I said, "Yeah, fucking right," because a like the music is already perfect. Like, what could you do with it? Yeah, and also it's so well known. Um, I mean, it's like that that universe is so particular and so such a big part of what made my aesthetic life possible it seemed like like too fraught to explore right um but uh angela just essentially told me not to be a wuss um and even though it would be hard just like why not <laughs> like challenge yourself you lazy sure. fuck yeah yeah um so we thought about it a lot um and um Kind of came to the conclusion that instead of just making them sound like the record which would be pointless because they already sound totally perfect is because they had been so influential is to to it's, it's sort of a little convoluted is to approach them as if uh as if we had written them because they had in so many ways made the way that we do whatever it is we try to do possible um it's so, kind of like core to the dna of the the world you're operating in to oh absolutely degree, right absolutely. i mean <laughs> like like if i like if i was going to say five things that made shushu possible twin yeah. peaks and the david lynch universe is one of the five things for yeah, sure sure um and that i mean so that way it, it would it would be a more a it just wouldn't be like a chumpy like not as good cover versions you know right. you know like like dilutions of the perfection that they already are but it, it would be more of a more of an honorific like we were saying thank you to those songs by uh sort of trying to put forth what they had made in us um does, does that make any sense yeah no absolutely because what it is 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 um yeah, because it, like the... it was like trying to say thank you to the songs. Right, right. It and, wasn't like and the way to say thank you was to 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 uh, you know to pre pre present present the songs as they have formed us. Right. It... I feel like I'm repeating myself. No, no, but but it's not like a bar band doing "Love in an Elevator" or something where you're like, oh my god, like Jesus Christ, I don't, I, I'm not looking for this. It was definitely like I think it actually highlights what the band does but is honors the mindset and feel of uh, brought to it without necessarily ringing the same notes all the time you know I what mean, i mean, I mean like, like, I, like i think i and i i think if if that record worked that's I think tough it, too because that th those are again they're in a certain nerd world <laughs> myself inclusive those are like you know untouchable there's yeah, an untouchable yeah. composition. So, like, how I mean, would you and, even? I, with and that? I think to do like a straight-ahead cover is a dumb idea because they yeah. are untouchable. Um, but I, I think if if that record works, it's 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 just uh, because we love it so much, it would have been disingenuous to do to be anything but to try to be ourselves within it because it made ourselves what we are. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and uh but one one real difficult I, like, now, I think it's I'm, great by the way i, oh, I like I, I was like and i walked in I, I hate to say it i walked in ready to not like it i'm like all right it's not unfair <laughs> i was like let's see I, and i was like i believe i said let's see if they can land this plane uh and i listened to it and i was like actually that was really good i enjoyed that but i enjoyed it again i, I think it, it was the so the 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 the, the balance beam is you don't want to be too deferential well, we, we, we decided like we didn't change the arrangements or the chords at all. We just right. like we basically we got the sheet music and yeah. we're like, OK, how would we with the sheet music? How would we play this? Yeah. 
uh, I mean, because the writing is so is so great already. Um, um, uh, but I mean, one one of the things that was, uh, and it it was a lot of work. <laughs> it was it did not come about easily. We worked on it really hard. <laughs> it has to be, yeah, of course. Um, but uh, I mean, one one of the things that was particularly difficult for me is that prior to this, I had only sung Shushu songs, and all of those were very very personal. And this was like not acting, but like singing songs from another world, or like any covers that we had done. You know, with, there were always songs that I felt very close to her. It was a, a way to sort of honor that song. But this was entirely about like entering another world, and like differently than the, the Nina Simone song. Like Nina Simone's music is obviously amazing, but you don't like Twin Peaks is a universe in and of itself. It's a it's a sto- it's a, it's an already written story. Yes. Whereas Nina Simone songs, you can be yourself in a Nina Simone song. Like it's it's their songs, and you can interpret them as yourself and bring sure. yourself into it. But yeah, yeah. Twin Peaks, like we had to come to that. Like I couldn't, I couldn't like insert my pathos into this Twin Peaks songs because that's not what those songs are about. That's not what those songs are. So that was really really difficult for it's me. Hard. I mean, and I would we, we tour we toured it a bunch, and now I feel comfortable doing it. We yeah. occasionally will played songs from Twin Peaks at regular shows. I mean, we, we just toured the record and we just played it back to front. Um, but it was, it was, it was, that was very, very challenging for me at first. And the, the first, the first shows that would, this, this, we didn't, we, we kind of, it was, we had just had a big stroke of luck with the whole thing is um, w- the day that we got to Brisbane to play that show is the day that David Lynch announced that the third season of Twin Peaks was coming the out. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just like the timing was totally lucky for us. Like we thought we would just play these shows in Brisbane and that would be it. Yeah. But because that happened, like Twin Peaks became hugely popular again. Right. Um, we weren't even planning on, on doing a record. Um, but I had felt like I sang the shows in Brisbane really badly and I started taking voice lessons after that. I was so embarrassed with how I did. Wow. Um, and and we wanted to try to do it one more time. Like, I felt like I needed to redeem myself. We played it again in, in L.A. <laughs> sure. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, That's, you want, if you have something, hey, we're going to do it again and I can get to do it better. And feel, feel Yeah, it was this. kind of like, okay, I've now, now I, you know, I was not ready to sing them initially. And then I felt, I mean, I'd still would fuck up them, fuck them up occasionally, but I was more prepared. Like, I, um. And then like that, that uh, it seemed like that show in LA was going to go really well. So we decided to, we, I think we recorded the record the next day. I think we, we just played it live uh, over, over two days. Um, uh, but just a lot of, you know, but with the third season being announced right when we were doing all that, just a lot of, a lot of stars aligned and, you know, it allowed that record to have some likes for a couple of years. And we've, we, we played like the biggest shows we ever played was, was uh when we were touring for that record i mean people were coming to see us people were twin peaks fans so it sure you know yeah, i mean it's, but it's it was you know crowd. we were they were like four or five times bigger shows than we would normally play so it was a lot of fun and you know we got you know got to be very into the sort of the enter the fantasy land every night and yeah much nicer that's, places I mean, than we would normally play so it was that, really enjoyable that's that sounds like it sounds like it'd be a blast you know and was, and, yeah. and uh and by the way how great was the return too like i it's I, my my favorite david lynch thing ever it's, it's the best so, thing he ever it's did so yeah for a guy that like is uncompromising as his whole brand identity proposition it's like this is the most uncompromising thing i've ever seen and it's they, so I, it's so insane and i love yeah. it i love every it's part. great i love that like you could make a season out of the last episode of like there could just be this this is just yeah. like oh like and and there's so many the god of light thing where it's like Amazing! This is incredible. Like, like it, it. It has you know to to the layman has nothing to do with anything else, but it's got everything to do with everything else. And it's it's just like ah, it's so, it's a perfect distillation like what he does. And it was yeah, and, it's 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 great. I totally can, love it. Can I say that that premiering at the same time as the season of Game of Thrones where they ran out of source material and they just started giving people exactly <laughs> what they wanted? It's like this is television for you right here. This is the dichotomy. This is the dichotomy. Uh, thank you. Anyway, uh, but no, I, I think that's a great record. I think that's. Um, I'm glad it is a record. First of all, I'm glad it happened. Uh, cool. That that's right. So tell me about forget because that came out uh, next year, right? Yeah, it's got the uh, Arabic calligraphy on it. 
Yeah, we had we had um that one it, that was the longest that, that was the longest time between original music that we had done that that right. um, Angel Guts Red Clash and Commander 2014 I forget came out in 2017. It was kind of, I didn't really I mean because we had done Unclouded Sky and we're doing and I was doing a a bunch of other unrelated not related to shishi music at the time and yeah it's and not like you were sitting that, around doing nothing yeah just, <laughs> but, just, but it, like a couple of years had passed and i was like oh my god well, i've like written no shishi songs we better get going on this but we were having we had determined that we were going to do the like the in the box thing like we did with angel guts like have a set of parameters right but we were having a really difficult time figuring out what those were going to be but wanted to stay attached to that approach um and then uh one thing the twin piece kind of opened the door. like i like i said i had never really you know like sung songs that weren't very personal or about something very very specific and uh, not entirely linear but generally like i could tell you what every single song was about like i knew exactly what that song was about we thought okay well we haven't really approached songs that were uh kind of based in the subconscious or sort of based in the supernatural and at the time i was um getting very in, much like deeply interested in that approach to, to to life um partially to do with drugs partially to do with just where i was with the neighborhood that i was living in um and then uh you know and then you know, just list of curiosities to explore uh, so that record the 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 sort of content approach was to not to to al to allow the songs to f they all feel like something like i know, like with each song i know what it feels like but it's difficult for me to really articulate ex not all of them but largely to say like what this song is about um and that that wasn't something that was essentially like the box we put it in to sort of and it was it was something that we said we would never do before which you know was to have things be sort of impressionistic or based on the subconscious or not necessarily linear right 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 right. Yeah. um so that that was the first time we really explored that and it allowed the it kind of gave the music its its own its own shape um uh it, once we decided that that's the approach that was going to be it actually came together really really quickly um like yeah, we I, went from having like no songs to kind of having the record kind of essentially written in just a couple of months. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, and, and there's stuff like, like Wondering on there. That's a great example. There, there's a there's a total earworm, right? Like it's got like you know just catchy groove. There's a you know. Yeah, but I mean, I could. I mean, I know what that song feels like, but I couldn't. You tell couldn't you articulate what, what it's it necessarily about. about. Yeah, sure. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's not about nothing. Like it's about some feeling. Right. But I I don't. I mean, but I, and you know. But to say what that is, I'm not sure. yeah, it's just not right. It's not like it's going to be a straight on the face of it reading of this is the thing that goes to the stuff. Yeah, or like <laughs> the, yeah, you know, uh, everything we had done before that was you know about events essentially. Which is funny because I think that uh, I think forget is one of your more accessible records and probably one of the less cerebral, but not in a bad way like just like it's that's, not oh yeah that's that's i don't i don't think that's unfair yeah like it's... that was a that was a funny drug commentary to do because it was difficult to talk about <laughs> sure yeah because <it's> a... <laughs> you know because like everything yeah. about it wasn't really a there wasn't a lot to i mean there was a lot to a lot of feelings about it but not a whole lot to say um well, i think well... i think i spent a lot of time making fun of the lyrics <laughs> <laughs> well it's kind of, it's kind of I mean, and not that you didn't do this before, but it's a it's a very direct engagement with pop music in that way, right? Because I think about like some of, some of us, not all of them, but some of the songs, like "Wondering" in particular. Yeah, is, you know, definitely. Yeah, it was interesting because we weren't thinking of we weren't thinking about pop music. We were definitely thinking of songs. Yeah, um, you know, like 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 in a in a craftsperson like way of writing a song. Um, but I think just you know, anytime you put a beat on a song it becomes a, a pop song i mean there's definitely <laughs> in, there's definitely pop, sure. like you know with always or did i gotta hate myself like we we're thinking about consciously thinking about pop um but it just sort of evolved and that you know a lot of that record doesn't have anything to do with pop music at all it's meant like a lot more about maybe industrial music or um but there's sure. still but there's yeah. still song but certainly like wondering in particular like that would certainly qualify if i was not related to it and didn't know what the origin was if i just heard it i would say yes this is a 
the top song. Well, and I guess that's that's like largely, but but I think that's that kind of that's like a standout amongst the whole discography. I would say in that way, and the fact that it does that thing so well, and that um, for a large discography, I might add. <laughs> like for something to stand out that way, like well, it must be you know, must be doing the thing it's supposed to do well. <laughs> I think I think a, a lot of uh, like Greg Sonye wrote the harmonies on that song in the in the chorus, which I I think really kind of made it come together. And um, that's another one that John Congleton mixed, and I, yeah. I think the the mix and those those harmonies that those guys uh, ah, did, so they, good. They did in the yeah, mix that Congleton did. I think really like if if that song works, a lot of it has to do with what they did. In. It, 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 it elevates nicely in that uh, in, in that classic sense. Uh, tell me about "Girl with Basket of Fruit." Um, this one we we had this one the the approach uh, was very very clear from the beginning of what we wanted to try to do with this one, or you know the box. Um, the often aforementioned Chess Smith has become a Haitian music scholar and has studied with a number of Haitian drumming masters. And he introduced that music to me. Yeah. So I was listening to a lot of Haitian music. And then the then the, the predecessor to Haitian drumming comes from uh, the um, uh, Yoruba music. So I was listening to a lot of that too, which okay. is related, but, you know, other side of the world. So it's has some different characteristics. Right, right. Um, so uh, also at that time, we we're Angela and I both were becoming super interested in uh, demonology and demonic possession. Um, and this was also kind of at the height of, of, of you know, uh, this was, I mean, it came out in 2019, as you know, so a particularly shitty and fraught time in American history. Um, yeah. and, you know, I mean, which you could say that about every record. Well, yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, I guess if that's your metric, sure. <laughs> um, but you know, it's got uh, that single on the cover too, right? It's, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we were really thinking a lot about uh, the, the underworld, and mm -hmm. um, uh, so let's see, let me try how to put this together coherently. So <laughs> For part of it, we wanted to collaborate with uh, the master drummers that Chess was playing with, yeah. Um, and then a couple of Yoruba drummers that I had gotten to know in LA, and Chess played on it also. Um, so we, and then basically combine that with uh, like non-song structures, like to to take to 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 take to take their drumming. Um, and uh, add essentially like noise and industrial music to it. So, you know, co collaborate with those, those put the, see what it was like to put those worlds together. Um, and that doesn't make up the entire record, but it makes up, you know, a lot of the songs on that record. Um, and then uh, there's, there's an artist that we were, a visual artist that we had done some collaborations with named Jan Bo, and he had a retrospective at the Guggenheim and he asked us to do a piece of music for it. Um, and he had done some explorations of uh, the movie The Exorcist, um, some of the, t the text from The Exorcist. And okay. so I wanted to do something that had to do with demonic possession. So I, I wrote like, essentially wrote like a, a very long text um, mm -hmm. that was, this is so eggheady, but just was reading a lot of, <laughs> reading a lot of. It's the whole thing about the show, man. It's fine. About Don't worry demonology about it. and a lot of books about, um, uh, the history of violence in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And uh, just every, every day would, you know, um, kind of go through these books and that sort of right, like free form associate images that I was seeing or, you know, or impressions about things that I had was reading. It was a very sort of academic approach to dealing with lyrics and they essentially wrote like 300 pages or something like that. Uh, and wow. then like, then whittled that down and that became the text that became part of this musical piece we did at Jan Bo's show at the Guggenheim and then whittled that down further and those became the lyrics for Angel God's Red Classroom. I mean, uh, for Growth Basket Fruit. Growth Basket Fruit. Uh, so, um, yeah, anyway, that was that. <laughs> so is that. So it's a reference to the, the painting. 
Oh, right? so, oh, sorry. Yeah, and the, the title the title is there's a Caravaggio painting called uh, "Boy with Basket of Fruit." Right. Um, and that was another sort of uh, nod to Jan Boas. He um, went around the world and wanted to pointedly look at every single surviving Caravaggio painting. So we were thinking about that a lot too. Um, so, so Angela and I were trying to come up with a title for it. We saw this painting um, and thought Boy with Basket of Fruit was great. And she said, what about Girl with Basket of Fruit, which complete, like socially completely changed the, what it, what the meaning was. The, the painting Boy with Basket of Fruit is very, very queer, very sexualized. Yeah. It's sort of, it's like a come on, you know? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, it's, it's sort of like saucy almost, you know, uh-huh. or sassy kind of. Um, but when you change, just even changing it to girl with basket of fruit, the, the feeling almost becomes one of having to do with precarity, just, you know, but the, basically the definition of what it means to be female in the world at times, a lot has to do with being in danger, be imminent danger. Yes. Yeah. Just, <laughs> yeah. you know, by the definition of, of Which, who you are. I'm and not laughing because I think that's funny. I'm just laughing because it's, no, it's, it's, just, it's unfortunately it's true. Yeah, yeah. It's horrific. Uh, yeah. And we were both like, we both kind of came to it at the same time. We're like, God, that's all that it took to completely change the meaning of that. Statement. Right. And One word. A, a lot of, a lot of the record too has to do with kind of what, um, I'm a little embarrassed her name just fell out of my brain, but there was a, a young woman who uh, either actually was possessed by the devil or had some mental illness and thought she was possessed by the devil and her family just allowed her and her church just allowed her to starve to death. Um, and there's some, there were some recordings of her possession, you know, things that she would say in her possession. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. we was listening to that text a whole lot when we were working on that. And then, and some, a, a lot of the record is about an, an imagination of what it would be like to be demonically possessed. Like what images would you see? What would you experience mm. as somebody who was, you know, whether or not demonic possession actually exists, like what as a demonic, demonically possessed person, what are you experiencing? What are you seeing? What yeah. are you feeling? And so, um, not a lot of art about that. <laughs> Hon- no, I, I'm like, I'm honestly thinking about it. there. There isn't like, and, and if there is, it's usually like as an aside to some larger framework of a story, but no, like that is actually, Oh, okay. I will say, talk to me though. That came out. Um, which is sort of the demonic possession as like party drug. Um, oh, 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 is that, I don't know what Talk to Me is. Talk right? to Me is an Australian movie. It came out. It's actually one of the only uh, horror movies recently I've really enjoyed. But oh, cool. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a hand, and you uh, you engage you engage with the hand, and and basically kids get a high off of getting possessed. Oh, and, and there's there's a time limit to it. I don't want to like spill any part, but like I, it was one of the more inventive concepts I've ever heard because it's sort of like, oh, this is like the Molly of this outfit oh, or something because they're getting, and then everybody gets to have you know the entertainment value of like, oh, they're possessed. It's crazy, but like the yeah the idea of of it's a good movie. You should watch. I mean, like it's it's there's no great mysteries or anything to it. Like it, it, it's it's just a good genre movie. I'll check it out. Uh, but I know I think I should have given you a list. Sorry, man. Uh, but the you don't see a lot from from what is it like to be possessed? Like I don't I don't feel that like I feel like there's uh, like how it affects those that surround them, the loved ones or the you know like whatever whoever's dealing with the after effects of it. But that that's interesting to me because I don't think that's explored that much. Maybe it is nice to know about it, which is also true. But it was it was. Uh... I, I can't I, I get very scared I'm a little scaredy cat um, so it was uh, <laughs> it was it was interesting for me to dive really deeply into it well um, scissors and, however many s's you have in that like that's like it's pretty gnarly man it's, it's like oh I mean that's I mean that's that's you know that's that's one of those songs that a lot of the you know a lot of that imagery is is about yeah um, um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's not a it's not a relaxing record. <laughs> <laughs> not a ton of chill vibes. Um, oh, Eugene Robinson. Oh, Eugene's on that one. Yeah, of course. That yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes. There's yeah, a, that one's like, great. There's like a little sad ballad at the end of that song. That Eugene. Came up yeah. With. Yeah. Lots lots of cool stuff in that one. But yeah, when when I saw, it, I was like, is that a single? I'm like, is, are they what are, what are they what are they up to with this? And it was like, oh okay. And then I saw the I think I think I saw the video before I heard the rest of the record. I'm like, oh okay, I see I see what they're up to on this one. Uh, cool though, like cool record. Um, 
Thanks. I love the I, I, the duet record. I love that's oh no. Like that's I think that's one of the great album titles, frankly. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> um, all caps too. Great. Um, that was a. Uh, uh, that was the all caps was not my idea. Um, our and our guy from Polyvinyl, he said forget should be in all caps, and he also said oh no should be in all caps. Yeah, so was, that's I think I think that's a I think it's a brilliant idea. There, there's a lot of um, I love the the one with Chelsea Wolf. That's that's a the the 100 years. That's awesome. Like obviously like I like the Cure. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Me too. As you might guess. Yeah, as you might have. <laughs> But it's it's um, you know it, it's it's a it's a nice thing done well. Uh, there's, I was glad the Sharon Von Etten appearance. Great, that's awesome. How did this come to pass? Like, what what was I mean? Like, how did because I, I think as a collection of songs, it actually really works. Oh, thanks. Um, let's see. Uh, so just it's a little bit of a story. Um. As so you can just, tell, I'm not afraid of going long form. Okay, yeah. <laughs> hey-o, hey-o. It's late where I am. So. I, I know, I know. We're 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 round we're round to the end. We, I, we've know, already I, gone around I, the horn. I, I, so I appreciate that you're hanging in there. I can. It would it would be untoward of me to to, to <laughs> do anything less as well. Um, but my, so, my, my joke is, anytime the earbuds go, then you know you've gone long. Ran out of juice. They didn't hurt. They just they stopped working. They just stopped working, and that's again that's a sign that you've been going for a while. But <laughs> I don't mean that as an insult. I'm just saying there's a lot of ground to cover, right? There's a lot of ground to cover, and I want to get it all. So anyway, so please, yeah. Uh, uh, so just kind of kind of coincident, unrelated, but just totally coincidentally, several people that I was involved with, uh, either in art or in music, um, that I also thought of as close friends, just there's no other way to say it just all fuck me over in different but kind of intense ways um and it was just it's like over about 18 months or something mm. uh, and there's a uh, seven different people and i'm very shy i take relationships very seriously i take things really personally i'm a nutball um and uh it it like it led me to have a nervous breakdown um mm. just like i just i couldn't i couldn't deal with all these getting fucked over by people that i like it wasn't one person i mean it was like half of the people i was friends with yeah um i did not take it well and, i mean none of the things that happened were cool um and i it made me lose my mind so um i had to go to a bunch of therapy but also at this time i just a, a lot of people that I did not expect to hear from had heard that I was freaking out and um, made a point of checking in on me. Um, and it helped me to like realize that, you know, that not all people are complete pieces of trash that actually there's a lot of really sweet and wonderful people out in the world. Yeah. Um, and it much more so than the shrinks that I was seeing um it helped me to kind of come out on the other side of that i mean i had a big massive like overreaction to it but i'm just sort of wired to have big massive overreactions to anything um uh but it really kind of helped me kind of get my feet back on the ground and sort of start over as a person um and uh it's it seemed like because other people other people's kindness is what made it possible for me to sort of see the other side in a, in a constructive way. It seemed like maybe an interesting idea for this record would be to do songs with other people as like a, um, as like a, 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 a tribute to many people's kindness towards me. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, and now I'm kind of, I mean, I, now I think people kind of suck again, but not as <laughs> before. <laughs> So but for a know, time period, they didn't. Yeah, for, for a little <laughs> while, I thought people were great. Um, and, <laughs> and it was interesting because a lot of a lot of the people who reached out and were being particularly sweet, some of them were very close friends of mine. Some of them were people that were just sort of like music colleagues. I didn't 
know all, all that well. And some people were, you know, some people I had never even met before. Um, and the people who sang on the record, it's kind of all fell in that category too. Like there's some people who sang on the record who I still have never met, but I've just been fans of their music. Some people I'm, you know, just sort of musical colleagues with. And then some people I'm very, very close friends with. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, that, that parallel, I, uh, which was not done on purpose. It just kind of ended up that way. I, 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 I appreciate it. That, that I wind up in that way. Yeah. And well, first of all, yeah, that sounds like quite the ride. I mean, that's, that's in general. It, and, it's, it sucked, but I mean, again, I'm like predisposed to losing my mind. So, I mean, probably, probably a little more, a person who would be more stable probably wouldn't have flipped out as, as hard as I did, but it did suck. Yeah. That's, it's not great. Uh, there's, I think there's a through line on that one though. Like it's, it's, it's interesting having, knowing that context is interesting, but it's like they, there's, I mean, the record's not really about that. Like there's no, no. Song, maybe one song that was about that experience. Um, but like the idea behind the record is about that, but the songs aside from one song aren't, aren't really about that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and that's, I mean, it's, I guess you could like not engage with anything and just be like, oh, cool collab record. Neat. And, <laughs> And then just get something out of it and that'd be fine. Uh I think it's I think it's a cool record. Uh so in the act of collaboration, did you like find any great epiphany or anything uh with these, or was it just like the making of the record is divorced from the, the personal feelings of oh what's happening? Uh uh, no, I mean, they were, it was kind of happening con concurrently with okay. getting my act together. And, I mean, like music has always been the thing that has helped me to not completely, you know, collapse into to sort of self-destructive mess. So, I mean, it's I mean, it's it's something that's been there for me forever. So, it, I mean, so like leaning really hard on music wasn't a new thing for me. Right. Um, and this is during uh, pandemic, right? I mean, because it came out in 2021. Yeah, uh, most of it was. It didn't. It didn't start out. A few of them um, happened before the pandemic, but it was uh, like the Jonathan Myberg one, Sharon Van Etten one, Alice Bag one. Yeah. Those were all in person, and then right after that, the pandemic happened. So the rest were done remotely. Well, I just bring that up because that's um, it's a rough time for everyone. Oh yeah, <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean. <laughs> it turns out yeah. it was a little rough. Yeah, a little rough. Uh, yeah, and so that was a well, and there was, um, you know, it kind of plays like a comp almost, right? Like a compilation. Oh in, yeah, yeah, yeah. In in a good way, like a like a or mixtape, if you will, if you're of a certain age. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think the bottle of rum is with Liz. That's one. That's a great. That's a great tune. That's a that's oh. that's underrated in the pantheon <laughs> you know so like you got some neat results out of it right oh i mean it was it was an incredible i mean it, it was a difficult time in my life but it was it was an incredible pleasure to work on it every single person who sang on it yeah threw down like did a great job i mean not just like a, i'm doing a favor for somebody job like everybody did a fucking great job who sang on it all of the vocals uh all, all the guest vocals on it are superb yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's an interesting record, and it's definitely not. Um, it seemed much more. It seemed very fully formed, is the is the best way that I can put it. It, it didn't seem like a like a like it, it feels like there was a lot of thought behind it. So, from the, my perspective, anyway. Oh, thanks. Which, of course, is a perspective that matters. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that finally, that finally brings us. To 2023, which it's still 2023 for a few more days, <laughs> uh, and ignore grief, which ignore grief. I ignored record. Kidding. That means I, I didn't. I didn't know it came out until like you know recently. Sorry, my bad. Uh, to be fair, <laughs> I'm a busy guy. That's all I got to say. Uh, but it's great that this, so that's the one that came out in 2023. Um, let's let's finally at long last <laughs> to, to talk about that. Uh, first one with uh, Dave Kendrick. Oh no! Wait, there, there was the real indication, right? He's on that too. 
Uh, oh no, he played on uh, he played on Oh No a little bit also. Okay, all right, all right. So yeah. I Devo Sparks is one of my favorite bands of all time. Like I know who Dave Kendrick is, but uh, how do you how do you know Dave Kendrick? Uh, when I was a kid, I played in a when I was a teenager, I played in a band with him um, with some other uh, like incredible new wave luminaries and punk rock luminaries. Um, Paul Rosser from uh, Screamers was in this band. Nice. Josie was in this band. Geza X, who was a record producer. He produced Dead Kennedys and Germs. He was in this band. A uh, fantastic guitar player named Kenny Lyon, who's played with everybody cool you could think of was in this band. And then Pimply Teenaged Me was in this band somehow. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's what I meant. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I've known him for for decades. Uh, awesome player, yes. really re- really cool player. Yeah, he's great. Uh, and of course, Angela's Angela's there as well. Um, ben Chisholm is 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 on this one. Like there, yeah. there's a lot there's a lot of cool woodwinds and flute and like all kinds of stuff going on in this record. Uh, yeah, we did it. Um, uh, this this one was pretty. Like there's this, I want. It's not a concept record, but there's a very clear idea about how this record was organized. Half, half of the songs are um, sort of art song, modern classical pieces, and I sing on those. And then all of those songs are about real events that happen. And then um, the other songs are kind of like experimental post-industrial uh, yeah. noise songs, and those are about. Um, kind of inspired by like early sixties um, teen tragedy songs. With yeah, 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 yeah. Like the, in the, the classic uh, <laughs> that, that style where it's like, it's very pretty sounding and horrible things are happening that are <laughs> yeah, I mean, usually, usually young people. The, the music doesn't really reference it, but the idea of it being like about imaginary sure. and, and Angela, Angela sings all those songs. Um, just a lot of terrible things happened to some people that were close to us and we wanted to deal with those. Um, but they were fucking us up so much that we needed to kind of essentially find a way to, uh, cope with them. And we were listening to a lot of Angela and I both were listening to a lot of teen tragedy songs. Yeah. We thought, okay, well as, as an exercise, like a sort of psychological exercise to kind of get through the real rotten events that we're dealing with. Let's, write some like write some stories essentially and and put those put those into songs and um and you know put put these two things together like half real half magic real yeah and then (laughs) one one very distinct style with me singing and one other distinct and different style with with angela singing yeah it was so interesting that it's almost like the title being you know, in, in a certain way, <laughs> trying to ignore, ignore grief by working through it uh, creatively also, right? Or not, I don't know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I think, the, like, the title is is kind of, I mean, it's, it, it, it's not a directive. Um, it's almost more like a preposterous statement. I mean, to to us. I mean, it's not it's not important to me in any way that somebody interprets something in the same way that I interpret it. Like, right. I appreciate that someone would have their own feelings about it. For me, it's it's it's. I mean, I'm not saying I personally am not saying to myself to ignore grief, but it seems like such an insane, sort of like semi-inflammatory, almost hilarious thing to say. <laughs> right. Sure. Of course. Yeah. Well, and I like. I thought it was interesting that you, know, you split the singing duties. That like it's half yeah, that, and half. That, that's that's kind of cool. Yeah. That's new, you know. I <laughs> haven't heard that before. Uh, have you been to Pahrump, by the way? The actual, oh, yeah. Yeah. Crazy yeah. place. Oh, it's fucking horrible. <laughs> crazy. It's awful. Crazy. Like, it, like, so one of my favorite places on earth is um, uh, the Amargosa Hotel and Opera House, Marta Beckett's. Oh, cool. And Death Valley Junction. Uh, which oh my god, I'm doing it again. There's a documentary called Amargosa that's it's incredible. You, I, I assure you, you will love it if you, oh, if you I'll watch check it, it out. Um, not that far from Perum. Perum's like the next biggest. We'll charitably call it a town. 
because uh, Death Valley Junction is like population like 30 or something. Yeah, yeah. There's nobody there. There's Amargosa and like two other things. Yeah. Uh, okay. So in the Lost Highway, the Lost Highway Hotel, that's one of the buildings in the Amargosa Opera. Oh, no and, kidding. Uh, yeah. Wow. And then they, and they filmed, um, I guess, the externals and some of the internals. There. Anyway, whatever. Doesn't matter. Lonely place. Pahrump, nuts. Nuts town. Uh, unincorporated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I think if you look up Pahrump uh, on Google, yes, it still does it. First thing that comes up, what is wrong with Pahrump, Nevada? <laughs> <laughs> it's the first thing that comes up, and I love that so much. Wow. <laughs> uh, Art Bell. What the uh the you know Art who, Bell from 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 Fresh Air? I uh, know Fresh Air. Jesus Christ, not Fresh Air. Corey uh, McCulloch <laughs> from uh, Corey McCulloch from Shushu was Art Bell's. Um, uh, uh, radio tech. Oh no, kid! That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he was his radio tech for um, uh, yeah, for like fifteen years or something. So he, uh, Art Bell, moved to Pahrump and like lived there for years. Which, again, for people that have been to Pahrump, it makes sense. You're like, of course, that's where this guy lives. Actually, that does make a horrible sense. Yeah. <laughs> like, like it what is, what, is, yeah, what is wrong with Pahrump, Nevada? I want to I want to screen cap that, but I'll do that later. Uh, it's a just d- deeply strange, depressing um, place. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> that's that's probably the best way to put it. I hate to objectively pass judgment like that, but I feel like no, I'm within it, my rights. It's a horrible place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that's a song. Of, that's a song of the record. <laughs> I know people that are like, I've had okay time there. I'm like, really? How long were you there? Five minutes? Yeah. What were you up to? Like, what were you... like buying a Mountain Dew at the gas station? Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it's 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 it feels like a place that you should get out of the second you arrive there. Yeah. Oh no. I I, I had to stay there for a couple of days, and um, the song that is titled Pahrump is about somebody I know who is who lives there yeah it's a it's a drag uh lisa carver aka uh lisa suck dog did a book called the Pahrump report because she actually went and moved there for a while for reasons completely unknown to me wow that takes uh, some that's yeah it's it's pretty wild anyway that's 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 i just i i i find it fascinating that uniquely american Again, what is wrong with Pahrump, Nevada? Kind of way. <laughs> so I was I was delighted to see it show up as a as a as a track on your on the record. Um, there's uh, so so this is it's a cool record. Uh, it, it's very like it has its own vibe just because of the you two splitting the singing duties. Um, I can't actually find the freaking track list right now, but I think that that's a well, first of all, I mean Kendrick's great. That's what a, what a great player. Which is not to cast shade on anyone else, but like I I really oh, enjoy yeah. the contributions. Yeah. Uh, oh, um, <laughs> maybe maybe with the B A E, the maybe maybe I guess you would call it. Like, how do you, how do you how would you say that a lot? <laughs> I don't know. I never say it. Maybe I, maybe. I just write it. <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. When we, when we we played it live, so we we just call it. I don't think we call it anything. I think we, just- <laughs> <laughs> we call it one, two, three, four on the, on the set list. <laughs> uh, cool tune. Um, yeah, it, it interest, interesting vibes uh, on that one. There, there, it's it's um, what, 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 where was that one coming from? Oh, um, I'm a little embarrassed because I don't like I. I wrote the lyrics, but Angela sang them. Yeah. So, I mean, I just wrote them and I didn't really look at the lyrics since then. I mean, we've played it on tour, but Angela knows the words. You'd have to ask her. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. All right. That, All right. That, this, is another, this was another one where we just, similarly to Girl with Basket of Fruit, is we just wrote like a set of lyrics. Yeah. Um, rather than, and then from that set of lyrics. So, uh, um, uh, we then sort of cull them down into songs. So it's it's not like I didn't write the lyrics to Maybe Baby. 
like I wrote like 50 pages of here's the of, text and we can pull what yeah, we need. Yeah, we like, sure. there's the complete text to the record. Yeah. I get um, it. So um, I know the context of the songs that Angela sings about, but I am super embarrassed to say, <laughs> I don't specifically remember what maybe baby is about, but actually I'm at our little studio right now and I could. Hold on. There you go. We can get get an exclusive on that. You don't have to tell me too. That's why, that's why you don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to lay it all bare. You've talked and said enough. Uh, okay. uh, Maybe baby is about uh, God, I'm such an asshole. Maybe baby is about, a child whose father uh, abuses her and her mother, and she is hiding under the bed while her father is looking, it's trying to find her to beat her up. And there is a, uh, she lives in Florida. There's a tarantula under the bed who's crawling towards her, and she's having a conversation with the tarantula. Um, there you go. Yeah. So it's, it's about her coping with uh, abuse by finding, a friend in, in the natural world who um yeah there's a uh there's also some release some uh, remixes on this one that the place to bury strangers one and, oh yeah 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 and uh father, father murphy did one too yeah yeah, yeah that's that's a uh <laughs> nightmare remixes is that this is that the mindset that, that that's a good uh that's a good title <laughs> <laughs> Was it? Was it? I mean, do you just feel like those songs lent themselves well, or did that come out of a conversation of just you know, like was there? Um, let's see. Uh, we had done a remix for a place to bury strangers, and we, and we just decided to trade remixes. Nice. I nice. Great. Um, um, I'm a big fan of theirs. Yeah, they're great. Uh, yeah. They're super great. And initially, um, Chiara and Federico from Father Murphy uh, wrote melodies for the songs that Angela was going to sing. Um, uh, but um, Angela is, is a, is a very, very good singer, but a very particular singer. And um, the melodies weren't really working so much with her singing style. Mm -hmm. So they had mm -hmm. some involvement in the record already. Um, so, and because they knew the music really well, it, it made sense for them to, to do a remix also. Nice. Well, it's cool. I mean, it, like, especially once I was aware it existed, First of all, and then secondly, that that I was able to go through and be like, "Oh, cool! That's would not have saw that coming if I had that on a bingo card." But uh, that that was it was it was nice to hear. I thought it was well done. I thought that that was were cool. Uh, that that's all. I think so. Again, ignore Reef. You, you've been doing shows. Um, anything you want people to know about uh, this record of halves? Oh, halves H A L V E S, not a. Not halves, H A V E S. Sorry, I should enunciate. Uh, I I think we covered it okay. I mean, yeah, we yeah, uh, yeah we have uh, we we just finished a new record that's out in September. Oh, cool. It'll be out in September. Um, and then I'm just trying to catch up on some writing and then doing a bunch of other music stuff. Working on some soundtracks, producing some records, doing our subscription thing. Oh yeah, uh, the subscription thing. Yeah, God, 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 my thousands of notes. Uh. How's that going? That, that that seems like an it, it's interesting idea, and I've seen other people approach similar things. Like that seems like it's a product for you. Is that working out okay? Yeah, yeah. I I feel it's by some just I don't know by some sort of crazy miracle. It's sort of persisted. I mean, it's coming up on we've been doing it for like three and a half years. I mean, like a lot of people, we started it in the during the pandemic, right? Um, but it seems like there's a about the same number of people all the time like some people drop off and then it's it, it's kept like a pretty steady number since we started um it's been good for me because uh i mean we the, there's a fair amount of content every month i hate using the word content there's a fair amount I know, of music I, <laughs> I hate it i hate it too yet that's what we call it i guess so there is a fair amount of music yeah there you go make every month um so it's really sort of helped me to expedite my studio chops um and uh uh you know and it's also just fun working on music like if, if i'm kind of stuck writing regular shushu stuff um i don't have to just sort of sit and pout because i don't have anything to work i mean there's always subscriptions and stuff to do 
Um, yeah, and, and then you get like cool, weird things from the back catalog and stuff too. And yeah, we um, uh, so yeah, so we do a cover, and then um, an experimental piece. And there's the experimental pieces are there's like a they're in sort of twelve piece cycles. So like each year, we'll do a different iteration of the experimental cycle, and then we do like a, like a solo version of like some old some old songs, and then do stems, and then do a set of samples and then do a postcard. I love that it's also uh six dollars and sixty six cents and fourteen dollars <laughs> and fourteen cents and twenty five dollars and twenty five cents. I think that's very clever. That's that's it's good. Solid. I only do the one and it's one dollar a month and it's advanced access. And that's for this show. Cause I'm just like whatever. I don't I don't have the energy or time to do any more than this. Uh so um but yeah respect for those that do because it's a it's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> uh so you should come on when you have this other record this this new record out um, oh it's a huge pleasure yeah i would love to i we, we won't have to do three hours before we get to it <laughs> <laughs> but you know that's what hap- that's what happens when you have somebody has a great body of work right and you want to talk about all of it that was very very generous of you Thanks. i i i love having you it should happen a long time ago frankly that's on me but like like i said that's uh, if it was a long time ago the show would have been a quarter as long <laughs> take of that what you will maybe that's a blessing in disguise i don't know uh but no it's been great having you uh love hearing about all this stuff yes definitely come on again sometime in the future last thing this is the only can question that i ever ask on the show and you can choose to interpret it however you like but why do you do what you do it's very okay i'm very sentimental about music um, and I, it makes me very emotional <laughs> to talk about sort of music as an entity. Um, music is great. Why wouldn't I, <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying our music is great, but like, it's one of the most wonderful things in the entire world. Like I, I feel incredibly uh excited to work on music every day um i i wake up and i look forward to it um so that's why i i i would give music a giant hug every minute of my life if music was a solid thing i just i i love it very very much and very very deeply and kind of sweetly and i oh my god this is insane tears are coming to my eyes saying this <laughs> I am a crazy person. Anyway. Jamie Stewart, it's been so great having you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's really nice to talk to you. Thanks for your incredible amount of time. And uh, thank you for spending the time with me. And A pleasure. We'll, we'll, we'll say see you next time. I hope so. It's nice to see your face. Bye. Take care. There they go. Jamie Stewart. How awesome. I uh, hope you all enjoyed that. That's great. I'm going to play something off of the new... Sushi record. This is, it's got to be Perump, right? This is Perump. Here we go. It's going to sound like this.
There you go. That was Perump off of Ignore Grief. That's by Zhushu featuring Jamie Stewart. That's the new one, newish one. Uh, what a great conversation. Hope y'all enjoyed that. Uh, we went deep. We went very deep on that one. And that's the kind of thing you can expect. The Protonic Reversal. Uh, Zushu.bandcamp.com. Uh, available you know, wherever you find your records, really. Uh, you can join that. Is this thing on? It's Zushu69.bandcamp.com for their um, subscription thing. So you, you can check all that out for the subscription benefits. Hey, thanks so much for listening. This has been Code Neutron's Protonic Reversal. Thank you so very much for listening to it. This show airs normally, normally on Thursdays, 8 Eastern, 7 Central, 6 Mountain, 5 Pacific. Streaming YouTube and Twitch. Archives always free, podcasted everywhere. ProtonicReversal.com for the archives. No ads, no sponsors, no kidding. Although Crayola Crayons. Call me. But if you like the show and you want to get episodes sooner, $1 a month at patreon.com slash Bertonic Reversal. We'll achieve that goal. Helps keep the lights on. (sighs) Keeps this flying circus operating. So thanks so much for people that are doing that. Bunch of great stuff coming up. Coming up. Coming up. Speaking of coming up, Matt Cronk of Cunts. We... Fake Legs, many more coming up on Thursday. Excited for that one. Should be a good one. This Some news. Microphone turns sound into 
Thanks everyone sharing the shows around, leaving review, posting all that stuff. It helps people now. find the show. It's appreciated. Out on Stay safe out there. In the dark and lonely. Check you later. I got my radio on. Check you later. Can you hear me now? to my top 10. I'd like to thank our sponsor. But we haven't got a sponsor. Not if you were the last man on earth. She was prepared to prove it. This one goes out to a special girl. There is no special girl! It's the... It's the end of radio! The last announcer plays the last record! The last what? Leaves the transmitter! Circles the globe in search of a listener. Can you hear me now? Broadcasting if there's no one there to receive. It's the end of radio. As we come to the close of our broadcast day.